Good folks, welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, part of course of the Cover One Sports Network. I am one of your two hosts this evening, Anthony Prohaska, joined as always by Eric Turner. And Eric, ah, rough, rough week five for the Buffalo Bills yeah. from a schematic standpoint and on the field perspective, which we break down here in this show, the X's and O's and the bones and the structure of the Buffalo Bills and football in general. But it's hard to come out of this game and not just feel something in your heart with Matt Milano going down, our boy Daquan Jones going down, this being on the heels of the Trey White injury the week before. This was a week, you know, as – as you know, as as much as we are like the science of football and breaking down what it is again, the bones and the structure and the schematics. It was hard for me, at least, and I want to gauge your thoughts on it. Like mm-hmm. just watching the fame, like we when the Bills lose, I'm not like sad. I'm breaking down. I want to see what went wrong. I was sad this week, like emotionally, like I hurt watching the tape. And we got a lot of pieces to break down. Yeah. But you know, what what were your thoughts as we you know dive into the tape this week and breaking things down? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough because obviously a week before we saw that emotional reaction from Trey White when he was down on the turf. And then you see Milano get injured and you see Daquan get injured earlier in the game. And those are obviously two guys that are the engines in many ways of that defense. Right. And uh, Daquan along the D line Milano in the, the, you know, at the second level and in coverage and doing a little bit of everything. Um, It was, it was tough. It was a tough blow. um, Especially once you saw Milano, you know, they talk about getting the car to the medical t- to the blue tent uh-huh. and getting him on the car and you see the air cast. You're like, OK, that's that you're already preparing yourself. Hey, this is a season long injury. Uh-huh. Um, the thing with the pack and Daquan Jones, you're like, OK, maybe he tweaked it. It's nothing uh-huh. serious, but it was no surprise to eventually hear that, you know, because he didn't come back in. He didn't throw on some kind of shoulder brace or whatever to come back in. You knew that was probably going to be a serious one, too. So. Uh, I know McDermott said that he ca- he's holding out hope that they could somehow return. Based on what I know, I- I'm not. I'm personally not, yeah. um, which is unfortunate. But as they always say, and you've heard several guys say it already, next man up. And that's why you're going to see some of the film from you know some of the guys that stood in um, this week against the Jags. Uh, we're going to you know analyze some of that defensive film. We're going to start off with the offensive side of the ball, what the Jags did to the Bills offense, and – you know, overall, man, it was it was deflating when it comes to the injuries yeah. and um, even more deflating than, you know, on top of the start, how they came out with that lack of, of urgency and they were kind of flat and then they'd be hit with those injuries. It just felt like the, it, the Bills were had an uphill battle the entire game. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. And, you know, I like the point you mentioned too, like this kind of game, not just the result, but the way they came out coming after the week before against Miami where everybody had juice, everybody on the sidelines had juice, the coaches, like the medical staff, like everybody was just geeked up for that game and to come out a bit flat and then have the injuries, the poor performance and all of that obviously culminating in the loss kind of makes it worse. But you know, um, Oh, Awesome comment here from Daniel coming in and saying, I've been uh, willing, maybe potentially waiting to see your analysis on Kai year's game. Always a great show. Cheers guys. Love that comment. Well, one, thank you for being here, Daniel, for the kind words. Um, but love where that kind of focus is for Daniel. Cause mm-hmm. Eric, you mentioned it. There were some players that went down. The bills did lose that game, but at a certain point, and you know, tonight being Wednesday, kind of midweek, you got to move forward. But for us here, for us to go forward, we do like to go back a little bit and analyze the pieces from the previous week. That's what we do here on the film room. And, you know, Eric, we've got a lot of important topics to break down tonight, some from an individual player perspective, some from a larger schematic discussion, but all of them aren't just important in understanding how the Bills lost or performed against the Jags in London, a lot of them, if not all of them, and spoiler, it is all of them, are going to be important in terms of addressing and diagnosing and breaking down for what this team is going to look like going forward for all the individual players we break down tonight, but also the schematic pieces as well. Yeah, and you know, we're going to start on the offensive side of the ball. And as I said, it felt like an uphill battle. Even on that side, early on, you know, what, two, three and outs, five drives, four plays, um, and they really didn't get going until, I don't know, bottom of the second quarter going in the half mm-hmm. and they engaged that double dip, which at that point I'm like, okay, okay, they're on track. But then they also had a few slogs in the second half. So, uh, we're going to start on the offensive side of the ball and it started with, you know, the lack of balance. You heard McDermott talk about it and that had to do because of the, the lack of a run game is something that the bills have been able to lean on the prior few weeks. And in this game against the Jags, 
it just did not show up. You know, we talked about, hey, that first play being a, a five-yard tackle wrap with Deion Dawkins rapping. Um, and we're like, okay, that's five yards right off, right off the bat. And But from there on out, there weren't many runs that, you know, got to that second or third level. And I want to start there, Anthony. I want to start with the run game. I want to start big picture item, right? We're going to talk some big picture stuff. Then we'll kind of break it down um, into the Jag game and show you here. So against the Jaguars and, and the whole shotgun under center discussion is huge right now. And mainly it's centered around play action. Mm-hmm. And yes, I agree. The bills need to run more play action from under center. They have 24 dropbacks uh, under center play action, but they also need to augment and, and run the ball from under center more. Because mm-hmm. if you look at this game versus the Jags out of shotgun, 1.4 yards per rush, negative 0.38 yards before contact per rush. Okay. So they're getting hit behind the line in shotgun yards after contact per rush, 1.75. And then percentage of runs, they got five yards or more. It was 30%. But if you look at the next two columns on the season, the shotgun runs aren't all that good either. They're ranked 21st in yards per rush at 3.9 yards per rush. They're ranked 10th at yards before contact per rush, which is pretty good. 1.51 they're 26th in yards after contact per rush at 2.17, which is 26. Not not all that well there. 40.7% in terms of percentage of runs of five yards or more, which is fourth. But, Anthony, under center, man, talk mm-hmm. about those numbers. Under center, which this isn't a small sample. This isn't 24 dropbacks like in the passing game on, on, on play action. This is a, a considerable sample, and it, these, these are concepts that we've broken down with Josh Allen under center, with James Cook. Latavius Murray, Damian Harris on the dot behind him. Talk about some of those numbers and why you like to see more runs from under center. Yeah, this graphic is tremendous for, you know, really putting things into perspective. It's not just the difference in, you know, from the season perspective of running, you know, running out of shotgun versus being under center. But so it's not just the ranking difference, but like the percentage point difference and the individual numbers, like looking at the yards per rush and shotgun for the year and seeing the 3.9, it's almost a two yard difference coming out of center that is significant like and it may seem small it's not because again the large sample size that is a huge difference and then obviously it's reflected in going from 21st to third and of course for everyone these stats are running back runs only yeah. these are not um even including josh allen who arguably is still the, the bill's best run game piece and again but eric that ties into even more of it too like yes. they've been able to lean on the run the running back run game early in the year and the yards yards before contact per rush big difference as well like almost a full yard difference on the season under shotgun versus or out of shotgun versus under center huge difference in yards after contact per rush, like over a yard and a half and a big ranking change as well. And then the percentage of runs, um, you know, five or more yards. And Eric, it's it's just been a piece to even if you're just, you know, wanted to have some recency bias, I guess, in in there. Two of like the ugliest runs for the Bills in this game came, you know, out of shotgun. That crack, that failed crack toss, the GH mm-hmm. counter. And there's just it's a different rhythm to this Bills run game when they're under center. They get to more looks. Usually there's also you know, more players attached to the line. They're able to get in more advantageous looks. They create more push and more vertical displacement. And the shotgun run game hasn't been the worst thing, but it no. pales in comparison like that graphic shows to what they've done under center on the year. And in a game like this where they needed more from that run game, like you said, I love that you pointed out and led with this. The run game, like everybody's talked about Dorsey and Allen and how they work together. For me, at least, and I know we've broken down a lot of it on the show, the, a huge story has been the success of the run game. Dorsey mm-hmm. and Cromer and their variations and what they've done. I mean, going into this past week, the Bills were second in run game EPA and EPA per rush, and that was due to what the running backs were mm-hmm. doing. This was a strong running team. They weren't able to get it going against the Jags, and that contributed to a lot of their sluggishness and the, how disjointed and hard things felt on offense. And then when you put it in, in perspective with – what they're doing out of shotgun versus under center. It's just a different ball game for them. Yeah. And I love this from Charles. Cause this is where I was going to take this conversation. Mm. He says shotgun makes sense. If they're going to yeah. run more RPOs and weaponize Josh's legs more. And those are two things sure. they're not doing a lot of. No, we're not they're seeing not that QB running... bash. We're no. not seeing the read option piece. <clears throat> we're not seeing that run game from Josh. And he's right. You know, when you're on in shotgun, you're able to weaponize that, you know, Josh's legs on, zone reads on those uh, RPO, almost like modern day triple options where you, you know, you're, you're doing the mesh, you're pulling it and then you're looking out and you're throwing it there. Like you're not getting those, um, those RPO looks and you're not essentially, you're not occupying another defender. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of people ask when they run the draw, when they run duo from shotgun, and most of their runs, you see Josh almost running to the running back and then mm -hmm. running out wide towards the sideline. Why are they doing that? Ask yourself that. They're doing that because that is their version or variation of, you know, trying to occupy a defender. They want an outside linebacker or a safety reacting to Josh as if he's running the ball or could keep it like a zone read, right? Hand it off and then run out there and occupy a defender. If you go back and watch a film, they're not respecting that. <laughs> the Jags are not respecting that. Rayshon Jenkins, hell of a game. Yeah. He had one priority, and that was to come downhill against the run, regardless if it was under center or shotgun. And so you're not getting that, that element of Josh's legs. And so until the Bills actually decide – to call that, you know, they did call. They got a touchdown against, you know, Miami last. I get it. But mm -hmm. at this point in the season, they, they usually have way more on film. Mm -hmm. So until that point, I think going under center more and running the ball under center more, running more of that play action, running more of those bootlegs where, you know, regardless if Josh hands it off or he's running the boot, there has to be a backside defender that has to hang back there and say, hold on, is Josh keeping the ball here or did he hand mm -hmm. it off? That's occupying a guy that is not in the run fit. And then that opens up things, you know, even more so, even more than the 5.8 yards per rush that you're seeing from under center. So that's a way to occupy that extra defender, whether it's a safety or outside linebacker, mm -hmm. and to keep Josh as a threat. And, I mean, if you, if you start running some of those play-action bootlegs with Josh mm. or half bootlegs, quarter bootlegs, like, things are going to open up because then Josh is going to be like, you know what, there's no one open. Then he scrambles and he gets out, you know, gets out of the bounds and he, he can protect, protect himself because he's only attacking half the field on a lot of those calls. So, yes, yeah. I agree. I think going under center, whether it's play action or the run game, I think that they need to lean into that more because it's obvious whether they're passing under play action or they're running it. They're pretty damn good at it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love that piece, you know, from from Charles and how you connected it there. Like my my thought with the the Josh Allen run game piece, like I've really felt like they've been sitting on it more to use it kind of like the break glass in case of emergency type thing or like implement it more as the season goes on. And it's been fine because they've been able to run the ball and those yes. under center pieces are great. And then you pair it, Eric, with again, we, we mentioned it sporadically throughout different episodes like you don't need a good run game to have a good play action game, but it definitely helps. And we've shown on this show multiple times, we're going to show tonight, you watch these second-level defenders that have to honor that run and that under center piece, and you combine that with how good of a play fake artist Josh Allen is with the ball in his hands. There's a, there's a multitude of plays. You, you know, this one, the – you know, the rollout um, on third down where he gets mm. the first down and like hides the ball like he's done a ton of times that we've seen or j j just regular oh, straight. Other thing, too, yeah. like his ball handling skills, like they're top notch. And yep. it's funny because a couple years ago we did a film room with Jay Feely and we broke down because mm -hmm. they went under center a bunch that year. And it was the same. They narrative. Made, and that's what made the Jets literally. like go down into the single yes. high and they just it, killed them with under they center. Killed them. It's literally the same thing we we're talking about now is, hey, they're running shotgun too much. And then they went under center against the Jets that game. And Josh is doing all these ball fakes, jet sweep, handing it off, screen game. You're taking all of that away from him. That's one of his, like, really good skills and traits. And so that's the other portion of it is, like, you're not keeping the defense off balance by making the showing the ball, making it disappear. Because shotgun, ball is always right here. Yep. And you, they try to do some window dressing where they'll have a, a fly sweep or a jet sweep, jet action come across as that mesh is happening, but it's not the same. You're not getting the same movement. Just they need to go under center more a little more. I think that is really where we're driving home. And yes, so the yeah. main story has been because Orlovsky's talked about it, play action. Yes, by all means, add more play action altogether. But I also think they need to lean into the run game. I think it just will help across the board. And it's something that, not there's not a lot of film on them. So like if they're going to take this to the next level and be and truly be an offense that is a Swiss army knife, I think that's the way that's where they need to start. If they're going to live in that shotgun run world, which again is fine and it, and it can it can work. Right. But Allen's going to have to keep the ball more and be more of a threat. If you're going to live in that world in the NFL, you have to be more of the Eagles with how Jalen Hurts keeps the ball. You have to be more in that Ravens world with how Lamar Jackson keeps the ball. You have to run more traditional zone read or you run that QB bash and you have to make your quarterback a threat because he is the numbers changer 
Yes. Offensively, that's what you're taking advantage of. And the Bills just haven't done that. And again, that that might all be fine and dandy. Maybe they want to save Allen's legs. They want to save his body. Sure. They want to keep him healthy, which again, cool. That's awesome. But if you're going to do that, skirt, put it back to the under centerpiece and create yourself some more misdirection. Create yourself some more easy buttons in the pass game. And I hate talking about it, Eric, because I feel like I feel like my mom, the next time I talk to her, she's gonna be like, Anthony, do you think the Bills should run more under center? Like, that's just like the like soup du jour for like everyone, but it is a significant piece. And as you pull up the passing pressure and passing concept data from PFF, you know, it really kind of puts things into perspective, you know, versus at the top half with clean, under pressure, not blitzed, when blitzed, but the bottom half there with play action versus no play action and, you know, being able to see. What's yeah. happened? So, Eric, break down what we got up on the screen here. Yeah, so uh, the next segment we're going to talk about is, you know, obviously um, we talked about under center. We talked about play action. But this game is so funny. On both sides of the ball, blitzes really decided the game. Crazy. For the offensive side of the ball, the Jags blitzed the hell out of Josh Allen. As you can see on the bottom left here, 46.5% of his dropbacks. That's not normal. That's not a normal game plan against Josh Allen. And on, on the year, Josh Allen has been blitzed on 30.1% right. of dropback. So a and he's actually pretty good. Point. He's yes. actually decent you know, against I've the got, blitz. I've got this stats. game. <laughs> this game, though, he, had, he was 9 for 18. He only had 67 yards, a 3.7 yards per attempt. And, and obviously no touchdowns, no interceptions. But Brutal. I, I don't want to say, like, it, Josh was bad. I don't think he was bad against the blitz. I just think schematically mm -hmm. he didn't quite have the answers – in this game, and maybe that's because they didn't expect it. I don't know. But as you'll see in some of the film, especially on third down, we talked about not being able to run the ball. That put them in third and long a bunch. And that's when these pressures were coming, sometimes simulated. Yep. But more times than not, they sent the blitz, and they forced Josh to throw it hot. They forced yep. him to get rid of the ball quickly. And underneath, they were sitting at the sticks and then just uh -huh. coming down and making very good tackles short of the sticks. They put a cap on everything with just their pressure package down in distance situation. You're living in third and seven, third and 10. And you'll see it, you know, when we break down the tape for everybody, you're seeing Campbell and Cisco just basically sitting at seven, eight, nine, 10 yards. And not, they're not really dropping because they know that pressure is going to get there. Allen is going to have to go hot and they trust their guys to come up and rally and make a tackle. And Eric, these numbers are so stark, you know, so you mentioned, uh, you know, in this game and everybody can see it on the graphic nine of 18, 50% completion percentage on the year when blitzed Josh Allen has a completion percentage of 73.1. So a 23.1 percentage mm -hmm. point drop yeah. 3.7 yards per attempt versus the Jags blitz game in uh, week five on the year, 8.1 yards per attempt, a rating against the Jags. This is a huge one. He had a QB rating in this game yeah. of 59.3 when blitzed on the year. 115.9, just a massive difference in the QB yeah. rating in his yards per attempt, where he was putting the ball. And Eric, what's a fun one and very interesting. I looked at this, I pulled this from SIS. So his on target percentage on the year when blitzed 81.6% against the Jags, it was higher. It was 90.9. .9. So it's not like he was throwing the ball crazy and he was like uh, out of control. He was getting the ball to his guys, but the guys that he was getting the ball to, those answers, like you mentioned, they were poor. They played into the Jags' hands and with that situation and script. And it was really frustrating because it was a piece. Um, I had JP Acosta on from SB Nation, who covers the NFL in general, but is big into the Jags. And his main point was, Mike Caldwell, a Todd Bowles disciple, loves to get into his bag on third oh, yeah. down, similar to the Bowles and that Steve Spagnuolo world. If you're in third and seven, eight, nine, ten, look out. They're going to get creative with their blitzes. They're going to play the sticks. They're going to play the situation, and they're going to bring pressure. And the Bills just played right into their hands. And again, kudos to the Jags, but it was really just disappointing to see, I, again, how how – Dorsey and the offense has hit on all cylinders a lot this year. It was disappointing to see the answers Allen was given and how things were just overall executed and played out on the field against the Jags blitz game, which was a big threat coming in and should have been known. Yeah. It's, you know, sometimes teams just have your number, right? Sometimes like a lot of times it's divisional guys, you know, divisional mm -hmm. opponents, but the Jags, for some reason, I don't know if it's the athleticism and speed they have, you know, on their defense a lot of mm -hmm. times, but they know how to scheme up against the Bills' protections, specifically protections. Mm. 
so and it, it showed in this game. It's almost as if they knew what protection the Bills were going to use, whether you know based on formation, two by two, three by one. And that's another reason why I like going under center more. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just keeps coming full circle. Because, and honestly, you heard Ken Dorsey talk about it. When he was asked about the under center stuff, and he's like, yeah, that's a good changeup. The first thing he mentioned is protection. Because you mm -hmm. got to think about it. In shotgun, you're not taking more than, you know, uh, more times than not. I'd say 60% of the Bills offense from shotgun is a one to three step drop. It's quick. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. quick. It's the same depth as if a quarterback was under center and taking, a, you know, more of like a five or seven step mm -hmm. drop. So, it's very similar in that way, but think about it from a pass rushing perspective. If you're in shotgun and you have a general idea where the quarterback's going to set up, you can go out wide. You can get those offensive linemen to have to come out and meet you instead of being under center. Sometimes with those condensed formations, one or two tight ends where you got to work through this wall and try yeah. to gauge as you're rushing, as your pass, pass rush plan is unfolding, you're trying to gauge where the quarterback's going to set up. It's a lot more difficult because from under center, as we talked about, you can run those bootlegs. Mm -hmm. You can run those half boots. You can run so many different things from under center. It helps protection. It gets those offensive linemen on those D linemen quicker. It disrupts their pass rush plan, and they're having to process the protection and the quarterback spot in the pocket a lot, a lot further in the drop than in a normal shotgun drop back. Absolutely. And then if you throw that play action piece in there too, now they have to honor the run on the way to the quarterback. So they're playing the pass rush, but having to play the run first, it just, it adds that little bit of hesitation. It adds that little extra bit of processing, let alone the, the actual schematic execution that they're able to achieve at that level, Eric, like we've talked about. And it was just, you know, we've seen them lean into it in a variety of ways and it's worked. You know, we, broke down the, the couple of weeks before with what they did against Washington, moving the pocket and going with boots and quarter boots and half boots and all the different things, changing that launch point, changing the spot for Josh yes. Allen against a very good front in the Washington commanders. The Jags had a quality group. They have a good blitz package. They have a good pressure game. And for whatever reason, you know, the bills just like, literally like played into their hand. And I think Eric, something we say all the time on this show with relation to the Bills defense, the Bills defense this year has dictated to offenses. The Jags defense dictated to the Bills a lot in this game. And actually, as we break down in the tape, they did a lot of the things to the Bills that we praised <laughs> yeah. Sean McDermott and the Bills defense for doing to opposing right? offenses. Yeah, no doubt. So let's jump into some of those blitzes and pressure calls from the Jags. As we said, third down was really, I mean, it's always the down. It's the money down. Yeah. But third and long, like you're asking for trouble, especially when you have the scheme and some of the talent that the Jags do uh, along that that first level and second level. So third and seven here. We're in the top of the second quarter here. Bills have their flood concept, sale concept, whatever you want to call it, to the top of the screen. Diggs is in the slot to the bottom. Davis to the bottom, the very bottom of the screen, out wide as the number one. And you can see there are several guys up and around the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And as the ball snap, they have two unblocked defenders. And that is set up because of, again, all those guys up near the offensive line. So Josh, he has to get rid of it. He dumps it down to Murray, and Murray immediately gets tackled. Awesome tackle. Like Again, mm -hmm. props. Props to Campbell from mm -hmm. coming from this depth at the sticks to come make the tackle on Murray. You saw the Bills actually do something similar on a dump down to Murray against the Dolphins, and he took it for 22 yards. This is oh, a very play, yeah. good tackle. This is a very good tackle. I'll show it from the end zone angle. I mean, essentially, the Jags are saying, you know what? We know. You're going to have to get rid of it quickly. And they only have three guys in coverage to match the three guys of the Bills. But, again, getting it quickly out of the quarterback's hands, the, the, one of the most dangerous quarterbacks, is a win for them, especially when you have a good tackle like that from depth. So, on the snap, I want you to watch the Bills' offensive line and how they essentially have to squeeze and kick inside right there. So, Morris has to slide to Luwakan. You have Torrance sliding to his left and covering that gap to his left on Muma. And then you have Brown. You see him right here. Watch him tap his inside leg. He's letting Josh Allen know he's got to squeeze. He's got to squeeze inside right here. And watch. So post snap, what's he do? He squeezes that inside gap. He picks up 96. And that's where you get these two free runners. Josh sees it. He's responsible for those guys, or at least one of those guys. He's got to get rid of it. And we talked about this on the flip side, as you said, Ant. McDermott, you know, is very good at getting the line to slide one way and popping a guy out. Well, the guy that Morse just slid to, he's popping out into coverage. Josh gets rid of the ball, 
And again, good tackle, a good tackle, a one-on-one -on -one tackle in the open field. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good play from Tyson Campbell. You know, we're going to show him getting burned a little later, but this was a good play from him. Yeah. You know, Eric, I wonder on this, like, one quick, like, little tiny thing, because Allen IDs Aluakon, and then obviously, like, more slides to him and Aluakon drops. I always wonder with little things like this, like, are he and Muma playing a game where, okay, whichever one of us gets ID'd, sure. that's the one that's going to end up dropping, like, because their blitz package yes. is so nice on third down. So I was like, oh, I wonder how much that comes into play. And whether it does or doesn't, it works out perfectly because, like it's, you said, um, it, you're it, that's a very a valid point because the Patriots had made something called the rain check, right? Mm. The rain check, a thing. The Dolphins do it to the Bills all the time. Patriots do it as well, where they're going to mug these two gaps right here, these A gaps, and then based on what direction this guy slides, that's the guy that's going to pop mm -hmm. out. So he's going to occupy him initially, and then this is the guy that's actually coming. So I don't know if that's the case here, but that absolutely could be one of the options here for the Jags. And the fact that we're even can, like talking about it just again, speaks to how well the Jags did. Like the fact that we're in our heads, like thinking about this piece and it works out perfectly more slides. A even gives that extra little step to get more to fully commit drops out, high tails it to get underneath Kincaid in case, uh, you know, Kincaid pops inside or Allen wants to look into him and you got Jags, Josh Allen dropping from the outside. So mm -hmm. look at the wasted, effort from the bills offensive line on you know the left side of the line but the right side from our vantage point right now you've got dawkins mcgovern and morse basically blocking one person morse really isn't blocking anybody at this point you've yep. got a two-on-one on the outside and then you've got two free runners coming off the left offense is right but the left from the defense in our vantage point right now and like you said this isn't like a bad aspect for allen murray is his hot so he dumps it down to murray and i love what you just drew up right now, the space, there's not a lot of room nope. for Murray to go. Side. Exactly. And going into the short side, going into the boundary, Allen has to put it over Jenkins, has to loft it a little bit. It's also like not the most ideal throw. Murray has to turn around a little bit. Mm -hmm. He stumbles. But again, you're playing into that spot. Even if it's a dime of a throw, there's not a lot of room to operate. And then you hit it from the sideline angle. Like when you look at Cisco, when you look at Campbell, they're up top there. They're playing the sticks. Like Campbell doesn't drop. He lines up at about seven yards, which is where the marker is. And on the snap, shuffles and drops a little bit, but he is playing the sticks. And look where his eyes are. He's watching the backfield the whole time because he knows we're going to get pressure. We're bringing pressure. He's going to go hot. I'm going to come flying up and make a play. And again, it just works perfectly into what the Jags want. And it's part of because of the down and distance and then execution and design from the Jags. But it's the Jags dictating to the Bills, making them go to this specific read and then the Jags executing. And here's another example of it, too. Yeah. And this is one where Josh really had nowhere to go on this play. So we're in the third quarter now, third and 10. Again, third and long. Yeah. And the blitz that the Jags send on this is just so nice. So yes. they're sending two guys essentially from the secondary, this guy and this guy, and they're coming obviously from outside. They're coming late. And these type of pressures have always given the bills offensive line, but more importantly, Josh Allen trouble, even back to Wyoming, mm -hmm. identifying that guy coming late. First of all, is one thing, but it's really on him because the offensive line already has a protection set right? They already have the protection uh -huh. set at this point. These guys are coming late. So it's really up to Josh idea. So a really good pressure. Now Harris does a good job of stepping up and taking up this guy, but this is your free runner. And you can see right now, again, you have to throw it past the sticks because it's third and 10. There's no one open. And as Josh escapes the pocket, still nothing really open. This is a dangerous throw to Gabe Davis near the logo, a very dangerous throw. Can he make it? Has he made it? Sure. <laughs> but again, the the stunt, the blitz on this play is just beautiful. Look at it from yes. the end zone angle. D tackles rushing upfield, ends looping inside. So what they're doing from that perspective is attacking Josh Allen's spot in the pocket from uh, from shotgun. You get a bad pass off between Torrance and Brown here. Torrance didn't have really a good game here, one of his worst games of the season. And mm -hmm. you see Walker loop inside pretty easily. Again, getting the quarterback off the spot. So now Josh is like, okay, I need to get out of the pocket, whether it's this way or this way. He's looking to digs the side. So he says, you know what? I'm going to scramble that side. And there's nothing there. He has to throw it away. Third and long. You got to stay out of third and long, especially against teams like this. And again, Eric, it's another example of, you know, the down and distance, the situation, bringing that pressure from depth and being able to create free runners versus the protection plan. And then also because Walker comes free and comes right up the gut, and, you know, if, if he doesn't, 
Allen probably sits there and gets rocked from the slot blitz from the other side. So, you know, maybe yep. we're thankful that Walker comes through here, but it flushes Allen again to that short side and not only to the short side, but this time to the single receiver side where he has, like you said, Eric, mm-hmm. like there is no option. There is no hope here. So this is his only liberty. outlet. His only yes. Hot right there. Outlet is Dalton Kincaid uh, uh, back the other way. <laughs> and he got pushed away completely from it. Yes. Like there's no chance he's getting there. Like maybe if he gets to sit in the pocket, he can hit Gabe Davis sure. at the logo, but there's no hope at this point. And this is the Jags again, forcing him into higher degree of difficulty throws, making the offensive line have to adjust, making Allen have to adjust and forcing him into an area of the field where there's less opportunity for success. And you can see the defenders, like you even watch a Luacon. He drops out of, there's that piece. He even yeah. throws a little extra, like, you know, some sugar on it by like faking, like he's going to blitz and he drops and you just watch his drop as he starts to, you know, go on the snap. He's just watching Allen. Mm-hmm. And then what does he do when Allen rolls? He rolls. And then you've got coverage on digs as well. And there's just mm-hmm. nowhere to go. It's them choking Allen and choking this offense and squeezing them into the short and small areas of the field and playing into their hand. All right, here's another third down, again, in the third quarter. Third and 10. And this was a play that was called, uh, there's a holding call on this. Josh escapes the pocket. A concept that we love from the Dable days, right? You know, that that wave concept, almost like a double post and an over route. Um, it's still pretty covered pretty well. But once again, the Jags damn near knew the actual protection. So they're mugging all these gaps. Look at this. Like, this is this is a stressful situation for an offensive line especially if you're sending everybody out into a route. This is a five-man protection with the running back exiting here. So this is a five-man route, and they're showing several guys near the line of scrimmage. One, two, three, four, five, six guys with a five-man protection. So one of, one of those guys, if they only send six, is uh, accountable by Josh. So on the snap, you're going to see how, what, you know, how it unfolds. So Muma drops out into the underneath area, and the guy in a bind is Deion Dawkins, the left tackle. And you see him. You know, he's kicking out to Josh Allen. That's that's where you want your offensive lineman kicking out to. You want him kicking out to the edge rusher, Josh Allen. But because he has to squeeze, as we saw in the prior play, he's got to squeeze inside. So now you're leaving Josh Allen unblocked. You're leaving him unblocked. And, you know, we saw earlier when yeah. Allen threw a hot to Murray, there was a quick tackle. So this time he's yeah. like, you know what? No, I'm going <laughs> to take it upon myself. So he does. He, get, he fools the edge rusher, Josh Allen, steps up in the pocket. But then you see the hold right here by McGovern, mm-hmm. and there's really no one open. He's trying to hit Knox right here on that over route. Um, and it's a little high, and he's not able to catch it. Either way, the play wouldn't have counted. But it's tough, man, because as you can see, you know, yes, Murray is open to the top of the screen as that hot. Josh probably should have just threw it. Yeah. But this is, again, the Jags taxing Josh Allen and getting a free rusher. Again, it comes back to the protection. It comes back to the protection, mm-hmm. and they knew how the Bills were going to protect on this third and long, and they attacked it, and they disrupted the time of this entire play. We've shown it so many times, Eric, of what McDermott and the Bills defense have done, putting tackles into that exact bind. You got a two-on-one. You got to pick which one you're going to block. Of course, you squeeze inside. You give up the outside. It's worked for A.J. Epinesa. It's worked for Greg Rousseau and a multitude of other edge rushers for the Bills. And even on this play, like, so as you go slow and pause it right there, right, as, like, Murray is releasing, even if Allen goes to Murray, like, here he started to move, so you're seeing the defenders react exactly. Even if he dumps it down to Murray, so it's third and 10. He's coming from behind the line, so he's probably got to go 11 to 13 yards roughly, depending on where he's going to yeah, get the ball Yeah, you see the hot. sticks. I highlighted the first down yes. marker. <laughs> I don't he's know if he's go- getting that. No, and the, those defenders are cl- are keying in. Muma, his momentum is already carrying him that way because of his drop in the coverage. Mm-hmm. And you see the corner up top. Everybody has eyes on Allen and that underneath piece because, again – they want that hot throw. They are thinking like, okay, he's going to dump it down short. We rally, we tackle, just like we did earlier in the game for those watching the show, just like we showed in that first play where he went hot to Latavius Murray. And it's also funny too that like even with all of this going sideways, like Allen still almost completes this ball. Almost. Again, even if it wouldn't have counted, like he still makes this high degree of difficulty play almost happen. And like but you again, said, man, there I, I, every defender except one guy are at the sticks or beyond. They, they're, they, they're, they they're just jam packed past the stick. Yeah. And that's why staying in manageable situations is so important. They can't just do that if it's third and medium, third and short. No, 
you cannot play the sticks and just sit there if it's third and four, third and five. Like once you start getting longer into the sevens, eight, nines, tens, plus whatever, and that's what we're, we've we've shown so far. And it's not like we cherry pick these. This is the world the Bills were living in for a majority of the early part, and even in the second half of the game, third and seven, third and ten, third and ten. These situations where the Jags can get into their bag of pressure packages play the sticks, play the situation, and then at the same time, attack the protection, attack the Mm -hmm. rules, and dictate to the Bills' offense. It's good execution from the Jags. It's a good job, but the Bills put themselves in that position to be dictated to. All right, so now on to some fun. We have, I swear, it's (laughs) tough, man, because each and every week, we're almost forced to cover under center play action. It's I know it's like that Mm low-hanging fruit, but... As we talked about last week, again, we talked about this last week. We had like a 20-minute segment about under center play action, (laughs) the numbers, the film. Damn near every time Josh goes under center and runs play action, he's getting – he's over a point. Yeah, He's adding EPA-wise, he's adding like 1.25 points every time he's under center running play action. It's like 1.25. So I understand. I'm with you guys. Run more play action. And this is why. Adding that tight end and both tight ends in this on this play – Putting him under center adds that extra gap, causes that safety I have highlighted to come down into the box to be that eighth defender, but more importantly, getting one-on-one on the outside for Diggs and Davis and the Bills wide receivers. This is just an easy pitch and catch, regardless of where Josh is, you know, when he's running under center, just a left hash throw to outside the numbers. It doesn't matter. Josh can make these throws in his sleep. And you have that big arm quarterback that can do this from under center. And I will admit, I assume that Josh likes being in shotgun more when you're talking straight drop back passing game. But the rhythm that he has from under center when they run play action is pretty. Maybe not so much so when it's straight drop back game from under center, but you see it from Josh Allen, you know, that rhythm, that timing, and those plays down the field, those explosive plays from under center. And that's why you definitely have to, you have to run it a lot more. That's a great call. Like that's one of my biggest like note pieces that the rhythm and the flow that Allen has with the under center play action game, it's almost like it like normalizes him or calms him. It just, and and I, that may just be my perception, but he just looks so comfortable. He looks in such good rhythm, like you said, Eric, and from the, the run action and, you know, faking the run to the way he brings it back in to how he gets back into position, his footwork, his shoulders, his, how he leans and hitches and hits the top of his drop. Like everything is just smooth and in proportion and comfortable and and this is like we talked about the pass rush side of things when it comes to under center like these look at these guys look at the they're not wide nines here they have to come through this wall and they have to engage these guys and again they can't just they're not just rushing it they have to process Mm -hmm. run the pass pass the run on this before Mm -hmm. they get into their, their actual pass rush plan and there are just ways to help you know some of these guys you know you got a chip right there on Allen. you're you're Securing this edge, like it just it's a different element at you know from a pass rush perspective when you put the quarterback under center. Absolutely. And you get the added benefit of being in more of a you know heavy run look potentially, plus you're backed up towards your own end zone. So maybe that potentially screams run. And you see the Jags bring a safety down and they've got cover three on the back end and between the play action and Dawson Knox released into the flat. There's that nice space for Stefan Diggs to work. Like there's just a multitude of fun possibilities that can happen for the bills when they go under center. And we've continued to see it. And just in case people don't know from a number standpoint, uh, there are 33 quarterbacks this year that have at least 20 attempts from play action. And Josh Allen leads all quarterbacks in the league with an EPA of 26.82. Brock Purdy is second Mm. at 21.64. Geno Smith is third at 16.7. So a big gap between Allen at one and Purdy at two, and an even bigger gap between Allen and Geno. Like when they go play action, it generates big time points. Yeah. Big time points, man. I just, I'm with you guys. Uh, Again, it's a low hanging fruit, but it, if that's going to help this team, which it will, and, and you know, again, running under center as well, I, I just think you lean into it a little more. You can lean into it. It's funny. The Bills, again, 26 drop back passes with the quarterback under center this year. Only 26. 24 of those are play action passes. There's only like two actual drop back mm. passes from under center. So with that said, let's move on. So this is that point in the game. We're at the bottom of the second quarter, 119, where – 
you know, the Bills offense was humming. They actually put a drive together, right, Anthony? <clears throat> mm-hmm. And so this is what we're going to call our making it look easy play of the game. Easy loan auto sales sponsored by easy loan auto sales. This is Stefan Diggs is touchdown top of the screen, a rocket shot from Josh mm-hmm. Allen from the left hash right around the 22 yard line, sneak it in there. I don't know what this corner was doing, Anthony, <laughs> with, you know, no help over the top and why he's trying to get physical at the line of scrimmage and damn near a two hand jam against Diggs. Well, Diggs uses that double handed swipe and then Josh, he spots him and he throws a nice flat rocket shot for the touchdown. At first watch, like I was, I wasn't paying attention to the whole coverage shell. And I was like, Oh, they're probably in cover two. And he was like a cloud corner. And I'm like, no, that's not what happened here. I, I don't know why Campbell is so aggressive. And exactly like you said, I love the two hand jam piece. Like it's so risky when you do that, because if you miss, you can get put off platform in a hurry. And that's exactly what happens to Campbell. Like he's left grasping at air digs, gets right by him in a hurry. And then, like you said, Allen fires a laser. This was the point where, Man, this this play was so nice, and then Diggs hits the Cristiano Ronaldo celebration there mm-hmm. as we're overseas. This is this was a nice, successful, dominant rep for Stephon Diggs and Josh Allen. And again, Campbell had a really good game. Diggs leaves him grasping at air, and this is when things started to you know potentially you thought the Bills were going to you know build upon this and get in further rhythm. It's not what happened, but this play was extremely strong for the Bills' offense for Allen and Stephon Diggs, and they did make it look extremely easy and of course you know this is making it look easy because this segment is sponsored by easy loan auto sales who regardless of your credit situation easy loan can help you get behind the wheel and on the road to better credit all of their vehicles include a two-year twenty-four thousand mile warranty and they have three convenient locations in buffalo lockport and niagara falls go to easyloanauto.com to start your accelerated approval this throw from Josh Allen had some acceleration on it. It had some juice. It was a laser. It was a dart, a javelin, whatever verbiage you want to use. Like, I love how also, too, he doesn't layer it. Like, he just, oh, I see the space. He mm. fires it. And he can fire it right on a line <clears throat> because mm-hmm. he has that arm strength. But also because Allen beat Campbell so bad and creates that separation, Allen can just literally put it on a rope and throw it straight to him as if he's just running, like, warm-up drills. Yeah, and just one little add-in. Uh, because we haven't talked about him a lot this year, which is a good thing. Spencer Brown. Yes. Spencer Brown has put together a few nice games. Watch his play against Walker. He punches with that outside hand and then engages. And then watch late in this rep, right at the end. See that hand right there? Watch this. Boop. Down you go. Like, hmm. that's good hand usage from Spencer Brown. Again, I want to throw a little kudos his way because he was one of our biggest worries going into this season. Mm-hmm. He's actually stacking some good games together. And we're talking mm-hmm. – a lot of one-on-ones, not getting as much help as he was early in the year. It looks like he's finally back to form, uh, which is really, really good to see. So, as I said, that touchdown by Stefan Diggs was our easy loan auto sales, making it look easy, play of the game. Awesome stuff from um, from those guys right there. And obviously our sponsors, we appreciate you guys sponsoring us here uh, this mm-hmm. year. So, on to the next play here, uh, another play action pass. And this is where we're going to get into some, <laughs> some fun here because – um, you know, these are the, the plays where, you know, if Josh is able to get a better throw on some of these deep passes, mm. this game is a whole hell of a lot different. So personnel, 21 personnel, Gilliam Knox, but again, on the line of scrimmage, bills are pushing it down the field on this concept. Dino post from Diggs at the bottom. And I will say, you know, Josh kind of hung this one up there, but mm-hmm. he admit he admitted that. Hey, it was one of those, okay, he's so wide open. I don't want to miss it. So he was kind of guarded on how he threw it. But I will say, watch the coverage on the back end. It's not the easiest coverage to really decipher. He, it, It's tough for him to anticipate this because I want you to watch these safeties. It's it's a tough cover to decipher. So on this side, as this dig's coming across the middle, you're going to see this corner pass it on to the safety. And, and on the other side, what happens here is as that sale concept develops by Knox, that mm-hmm. corner jumps it. And that's how you get this Dino you know, post down the middle of the field. So those safeties are almost kind of operating independently. So it's a tough read. Josh has to wait till very late in this play to diagnose and figure out what coverage is actually there. And by the time he does, Diggs is already, what, 40 yards down the field from where Josh Allen is, mm-hmm. 35, 40 yards. So it does hang up a little bit. But either way, big, big change uh, in momentum, big swing in the field there from Josh Allen. To Stefan Diggs for 48 yards. I love a good Dino post. Like it's just so fun, especially when it works and like and and t- 
taps in like that. It was so beautiful from Diggs, the rhythm of it. And yeah, Allen does hang this ball up a little bit. Like Diggs has to come back to it. And you know, it's also unfortunate too, that I think this was the drive where we get like the drop on second and 10 and doesn't mm-hmm. work out for the bills. So understand the frustration from uh, a lot of fans and seeing that piece. But again, Eric, we get an under center play action piece and look at the drop for Josh Allen. Look at the time. Look at the different rush for the Jags. Look at all the support he has. It's not the most, like the cleanest and most uh, like aesthetically pleasing pocket from like an arc shape or that semi like half circle that you want to aim for that we like to highlight all the time. But Allen's got protection. He's got time. You know, you see Gilliam getting some work initially, and you know attacks his man, which kind of feeds things into Dawkins. McGovern gets into his man early. There's just space and room for Allen to operate. And that's another piece too, right? Like you talk about Diggs, you know, getting clear that far downfield and the coverage being a little muddy on the back end to decipher. Allen has the time to decipher that. And then even with a defender getting in his face, like you highlighted initially, like this man gets across Morse's face, which isn't necessarily Morse's fault. It's just where Allen ended up setting up. In the pocket, yep. Yep, exactly. He makes this throw with a defender kind of bearing down on him over the top of him, maybe that also influences this throw. Maybe he's got to change that arm angle and kind of, maybe he puts more air under it as well. Maybe that's some kind of piece that influences Or maybe it. he, like maybe he can't throw it flatter exactly. with uh, more velocity because of that guy coming up yeah. into his face, right? He's got to get it over. It's like, <clears> if you're, if you're playing basketball, like if someone's got their hand in your face, you have to put more arc on the shot to get it to go into the hoop because you can't shoot a more line drive because hands are up in your face. And so in addition to Allen saying like he was open, you just want to get it there. Maybe the defender influences it. And so he has to put more air under it instead of being able to line drive missile it. Um, but again, it's a nice route from Diggs. Good timing. I love how it just, you get the safety driving on the knocks and it works with Diggs in that piece, but it ties into again, Unfortunately, as we continue to beat this drum, the under center play action piece, it gives Allen the time, the space, slows down the rush, and it creates a big explosive play. All right. And so here's one that obviously leads to an interception. Diggs is at the bottom of the screen running a similar post pattern uh, versus, again, a really muddied coverage. And I'll break that down here in a second. But you saw the route from Diggs running that post. This is the wave concept. We saw it a few plays earlier. Let me go back because I I didn't highlight it when we were uh, watching it. But the pass that went incomplete to... The one where he pump faked um, Murray and Josh Allen jumped up. It was it was a third and ten inside. This one right here, right? Yeah, yeah the holding play. Yep. So again, this is the wave concept. Watch Davis on this play. He's running the post route that Diggs is on this play. So watch him on that post route and how the middle of the field is open for him. So I'm, I'm sure they're like, oh, hold on. While we're looking to get it here there's probably some green to be had here. So fast forward to that touchdown or the interception here later in the game. So now they're running that same concept, basically double post and a deep over. And I said this coverage is muddy because if you look at this, you're probably thinking, hey, this is really just like a cover three, three deep, four under, right? But if you look at this guy, he's playing more of like a robber technique. To me, this screams like an inverted Tampa two Mm. inverted cover three where that guy is kind of like the high hole player in, in, in robbing any of these crossing routes. And these guys are the deep half players. So again, muddied coverage deep down the field where Josh has to kind of let it unfold and decipher it late in the rep, late in the play. He does a good job of manipulating the pocket as you'll see from the end zone angle. And then, you know, throws it deep down the field and the, the corner recovers really well and makes a nice play. And, and you got to give him props there because, as I said, Josh Allen from the pocket, he did a great job of manipulating the pocket here with Josh Allen, the edge rusher, coming and uh, disrupting his spot in the pocket. Look at him slide right there. Mm-hmm. And he gets a piece of the ball. So, as he admitted, as Allen gets a piece of the ball right there, he has to refit the laces and refine the laces and then throw it that distance mm-hmm. down the field. Like, that's a lot going on from reading the coverage pre to post snap you know, manipulating the pocket and avoiding uh, an elite edge rusher and then dropping a pass down the field to your playmaker, you know, that deep down the field. There's a lot going on on this play, but yet people would just be like, oh, yeah, he underthrew him or he didn't place (laughs) it properly. Like, yeah, good luck trying to execute this. Like, this is not easy to do, Anthony. And it's on third and 15. So the Jags, again, like playing off and they're playing the sticks. Like, you look at the corners, 
initial alignment, they're 10 yards off. They know that they got five yards left left to play with. You see how deep Andre Cisco is, number five in that middle of the field. And then you look at Rajon Jenkins comes screaming. He's initially on the line, but he bails hard and watch how fast he drops this isn't like oh i'm trying to take something away underneath he's bailing and he's getting to the sticks and they create that umbrella again to keep everything in front of him like they have so much in this game and eric you nailed everything there's not too much for me to add like the coverage i love that you went with the inverted two or potential like three piece because i was sitting here like i rewound this maybe like 10 times and i was like yeah. what is this and that's what i settled on just because I, again, I, I guess great minds take a like, but it's I, I love that piece from Cisco. Like, because from exactly what you said, you're thinking, okay, cover three, cover three, and then he kind of comes up and drives on it a little bit, and you're yeah. like, okay, so is it? And the fact that we rewound this a bunch to try and decipher it, and still are kind of like, well. Now compare that to Josh Allen, who has to make that read on the fly mm -hmm. with pressure in his face while he refits the laces and grip on the football, and he's trying to convert on a third and 15, and he's moving in the pocket and manipulating things, and then has to reset and make a good throw. Like, we have this eye-in-the-sky excellent vantage point to decipher. This and that's just one piece of it, the coverage piece. Imagine what he has to do in this instance. So, again, I... I I would have loved it if he leads digs a little more and it's a touchdown, but it's understandable given everything else that's going on. And this is also a really good play by Williams. Like kudos yeah. to him. And you know, digs digs is going to be so pissed at himself. Like 50, 50 ball. He should come down with that. I thought he did. Initially. I thought he had it. Yeah, yeah. he did initially have it. And I was like, Oh, you know, maybe it got rustled away from him after. And you know, Ty goes to the receiver, but you know, kudos to the Jags again, that them making a play, them dictating, taking advantage of situations and down in distance, they made a play and they did a good job. Yes, and so we're going to move on to our next uh, segment. This one's sponsored by Jonathan Miller from Metro Roberts Realty. This is what we're calling our real estate rewind, and this is, again, late in the game, uh, almost too late at this point. Bottom of the screen, I want you to watch the combination between Gabe Davis and Stefan Diggs uh, because you're going to have uh, the touchdown pass from Josh Allen to Gabe Davis, and Davis is running a corner route, and Josh reads it perfectly. He reads the leverage of that corner perfectly, throws it back inside, and Good adjustment from Gabe Davis to kind of throw that corner by here as that ball's coming in, throw him by, and then just, again, opens up his hands and the, the ball's right there. But look at the anticipation mm -hmm. from Josh Allen sliding up into the pocket. And then when he goes to release this, look at where Davis is. Again, Davis isn't open. This mm -hmm. is the epitome of throwing a guy open here. Mm -hmm. Throws him back open to the middle of the field. Davis is able to adjust for the touchdown. This was also what the second touchdown in two plays because the first yeah. one got called back and nobody knew why or what had happened. Um, this is such a really pretty throw, and it's it's not mm. on the sideline, but it's equivalent to basically just like a back shoulder throw on the sideline. What you saw Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams do for years in Green Bay with Rodgers throwing Adams open and throwing it to that back shoulder, except this time the back shoulder for Gabe Davis is his inside shoulder as he runs that corner route. Such a pretty throw. And look at look at the ball placement where he puts it. He has to put it away from Campbell. Contested, who, too. Who's man. in good position, exactly, and then contested on top of it. This is a really good catch from Gabe Davis. So the ball placement and location from Allen – on the run, on the move, with anticipation, ridiculously good ball placement against Campbell, who's in good position and in good coverage and makes a play on the ball. And then good on Gabe Davis for making this catch in general, having to adjust to it, having to adjust to the ball placement, but having to do it with Campbell kind of draped on him. And then, Eric, you highlight the rushers here. The, the Jags did this all day. Yes. And it's something I remember hearing about this years ago. Actually, I think it might have been Von Miller talking about the Super Bowl he played in against Carolina where their plan on Cam Newton was ha to have a guy low, rush him low, and then have a guy rush high on the high side. So here mm -hmm. you're seeing, again, attack the pocket, right? Attack that spot in the pocket by one of those rushers coming inside, getting Josh off the pocket, and then this rusher staying on the high side and almost kind of like a, what they call a fish hook rush where he's coming around the back. He's not expecting to bend and flatten to the quarterback, what he's expecting is for this quarterback to leave the pocket and then he's going to fish hook behind him and strip him from behind. So this right here for Josh Allen to not only avoid the edge rusher, Josh Allen spiking inside against Dawkins, but for him to step up into the pocket and set up outside mm -hmm. of the pocket was phenomenal on top of the throw down the field. Like again, good stuff from Josh Allen, the quarterback from the pocket in this game when the Jags were sending a lot of different things at him. 
Absolutely. And it was a good job from Josh and from Gabe Davis. And that's why I made our Real Estate Rewind. And of course, this segment sponsored by real estate agent Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. Cutting edge technology that Jonathan uses to sell your home faster. In addition to professional photographs, a 3D virtual tour, drone photos, videos, all that stuff is included with each listing at no extra charge. He loves working with both buyers and sellers and in all price ranges, which is super awesome. And he also donates a portion of his commission from each sale to rescue an animal. His phone number can be found in the episode show notes, whether he on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform. And again, man, I, I never know who really like wins out, but Jonathan's had some good ones these past couple of weeks. The real estate <laughs> rewind ones have been clutch. I know it's uh it's tough every week. It's tough. You know, sometimes I have him, uh, our, our sponsors kind of pick the segment, what play they want. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's you know each week. I'm like, all right, no, let's, let's flip it. Let's <laughs> like, let's you guys run this one this week because, uh, and a lot of times it's, it's lately been a lot of Josh Allen, the Stefan Diggs. Um, that one, we got Davis involved on that. Again, great work from the pocket. Um, great anticipation and, and placement from Josh Allen. Um, mm-hmm. Just good stuff all around. To wrap up the offensive side of the ball, I got to give kudos to the Jags, man. They match up well Absolutely. with the Bills, and they know how to attack the Bills' pass protections. And yeah. once they started shutting down the run, and the Bills kind of just gave up in that situation, which I understand – why they did because again once you get a few three and outs and and four play drives you're not able to sustain drives you're not able to really find that balance and sustain drives that way where you're running a little bit of everything not just you know certain concepts or certain run uh runs you're not able to kind of open up your bag at all because you can't sustain drives so they were very limited in the run game it led to a lot of those third and longs it led to the jags attacking the protections playing the sticks and it led to a lot of trouble for the bills and I will say, I don't think Josh played a bad game. I don't think the offense played a bad game. It just, it was a slog. It was an uphill battle. And there are many factors and reasons behind that. But in the end, kudos to the Jags defense. Yeah, they they made things hard on the Bills offense. They made it a slog. They made everything feel sluggish and slow and difficult for the Bills offense. And yeah, I, again, I, I, I led with that piece last night in disguise coverage. I mentioned it earlier mm-hmm. here in the film room. Like, I, I think so often we get caught up in when your team fails. It's like, oh, well, because my team failed and my team sucks. But a lot of it was like tip your cap to what the Jags did in this game. They got the better of the Bills. They made the plays. This is also a defense and a team. They played the Kansas City Chiefs tough really tough a couple of weeks ago. And I know everybody saw the London game and well, the Falcons are bad. And then also like the Jags, you know, losing a bad game earlier in the year. It's like, Oh, I think people kind of overlooked them a bit. This is a good team. They gave Kansas city trouble last year in Kansas city. Granted Mahomes picked up a knock in that game, but Mm -hmm. I, I like what you said, like them matching up with the bills and what they did. They also have a really good front and their ability to work well against the run is something that they've hung their hat on all year, especially on early downs. And, you know, for a bills team that came into this game in, you know, week five, second in EPA per rush and second in rushing EPA, the Jags held them to 14th in EPA for week five and 19th in EPA mm-hmm. per rush in week five. So the Jags were effective, you know, from right from the rip. All right. And so I, I labeled this, uh, the, I titled the title of this YouTube, uh, uh, headline was, you know, the, the bills really were doomed by the blitz. And, and we showed you mm. how the blitz and pressure kind of slowed down Josh Allen. But I will I say, know, flip it. We, <laughs> you flip the script here and, you know, McDermott, like I'm going to start with McDermott, like the play call or the play designer, the stuff that he's doing. And I'm not just, this is well before we were even talking about the injuries and how he adjusted. Like that was a hell of a coaching job. First of all, mm-hmm. once all those injuries happened. But the aggressiveness and things he's doing, it's night and day compared to prior years. Like some of the coverage rotations, some of the pressures and blitzes that they're calling. Mm -hmm. It's stuff that like I have to like write notes on because it's stuff we hadn't seen since he was a a defensive coordinator in Carolina. So I'm like having to go back through all my notes from those back then. Mm -hmm. And they tried heating up Lawrence in this game. They blitzed him 34 percent of his dropbacks he was 10 for 15 he completed 66.7 percent for 135 yards at nine yards a clip so what we're going to look at is some elam footage we're going to look at some dorian williams footage and we're going to try to show you some like how that context of pressure and blitzing played into some of the things that went well and didn't go well because the issue in this game was 
you can see some of the numbers are really good when they blitzed Lawrence. But Lawrence mm -hmm. did a great job of hanging in there for well over two and a half, three seconds against these blitzes and made some big time throws down the field several times against Elam that you're going to see. He handled the blitz very well. But more importantly, the blitzes just weren't getting home quick enough. Like the, yeah. the coverage wasn't in sync with the pass rush and the, the pass rush concept when you're adding five or six pass rushers. And it allowed Lawrence to get those one on ones down the field and complete some big, big time throws. Or completing stuff, uh, you know, over the middle and underneath to his outlets or checkdowns right away with guys still dropping. And Eric, it's another hate to keep, you know, going to the well, like we've said, but you know, you juxtapose it with what the Bills defense did against Miami the week before, where cover it didn't start. It started out a little disjointed, but after the Dolphins scored that second touchdown, coverage and pass rush were just in harmony, like a beautiful point, marriage mm -hmm. for the Buffalo Bills. And it that's just not what you saw this week. And there were also so many throws like against the Blitz, but just in general. Lawrence was dealing in this game. Calvin Ridley looked every bit of a wide receiver. Oh my one. god! Like he's he's, a he's in that upper tier. He he's, he's so fun to watch. Good. He's so good. Lawrence had a tremendous. Oh, I gotta stop because we got we we got a super chat. I have a point, but I want to bring up this White first. White Towns Kings kind kind of common member yeah. of our our live chats and streams. So appreciate you being here. And for the super chat, thank you very much. And he says, I still believe, ooh, I still believe if we would have recovered that fumble in the third instead of knocking it out, the Bills would have flipped that game with the short field. When I got, I forgot about it when I got to it yeah. in the film and watched everybody like bumbling and the ball going out. And I felt like it should have been played to like the, bah, 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 the music. <laughs> and it just, I was just like, oh, if they could have gotten the ball, like that's a fair point though. In a game that was that ended up being this close and was close the whole way, those turnovers, especially where that, would have put the Bills offense from a field position standpoint. It's fair to kind of, you know, if you're White Towns King or anybody, look at that moment and think like, oh, you know, what could have been if they got on that ball? Yeah, no doubt. And as I said, like the defense was swarming. Mm -hmm. You know, I know they gave up what 25 to the Jags, but yeah, the stuff that they were calling, there's there's some risk involved with it, mm -hmm. but they're seeing those rewards as well, you know, and you know, Epinesa had a game at Oliver. This might have been Bro. at Oliver's best game. He was dominant. He was dom. There are reps where he's his one with he's like he gets into his man and literally long arms him and controls him while he drives him. He's peeking in the backfield and then the back bounces. Yeah, out. he's like, oh, okay, chucks his man. He's he was dominant inside. Dominant. Yeah, it was again from a pass rush standpoint, from a, a run standpoint, and, and and again it comes back to Lawrence. There were players where at Oliver won quickly, got into his face, and then Lawrence. Just got rid of it in time, and it was a big time throw down the field. I know he, you know, Ed Oliver drew a penalty uh, in the red zone there, but overall, like Ed Oliver was again. I I think this was one of his best games as yeah. a pro, and he's he's seeing things so well. Especially you're talking run game. He's number two in run stop percentage right now. He is seeing the blocks coming before they happen. He is processing a lot quicker in the run game, and on top of you know the pass rush plan stuff of. Putting him in a two-point stance, that's freaking cool. And I think something that the Bills and Eric Washington and Sean McDermott probably stole from the mm -hmm. Cleveland Browns and Jim Schwartz and how they are using Miles Garrett in that way mm -hmm. over the interior offensive lineman in a two-point stance, moving around a little bit. So I like what they're doing on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. Uh, and So right now, let's jump into some of the film, Anthony. I want to talk about Kair Elam because obviously he's a guy that you know we did a film room with. He's mm -hmm. a guy that a lot of fans have been clamoring for. You know, to play. So I'm going to get your um, thoughts off the top rope right now when about his play, his overall play um, in this game against the Jags and, and maybe even going forward. The first thing with it, and I just find it so funny last year, it was just everybody clamoring for more Kyrie Elam and how it, the McDermott and the staff are doing him a disservice by not playing him. And this year, now it's just he sucks and can we trade him for Pat yeah. Sertain or trade him for whatever? Like it's just funny to see how everything flips. I don't think he had a good game by any means. And I think you saw in this game, there's a reason why he was beaten out by Christian Benford and Dane Jackson. Right. But upon the rewatch and Eric, you and I were talking about this uh, yeah. over text last night or the night before. I don't think he was as bad as everybody like wants to make it out to be. You know, he had some unfortunate missed tackles in the run game. Eric, you know, you called it out, um, which mm -hmm. is why he was pulled, you know, when Ingram went in later, you know, slipping off guys against the run. But he, but even that he was in position. Like he was yeah. feeling well, he was coming up. And even in some of these, when he's losing in coverage, it's almost like you just see him panic. Like if, if he's impressed and he loses at the release point on the snap, or if he's 
in position, but something happens late in the stem or in the break. You see him just kind of panic, and he gets a little grabby. And then there's also certain points, like on this one, this is a great route from this, Calvin Ridley. This is Ridley. a great route. Like Watch I, I am like, not, I'm not, he, I'm not dinging him for this play. No. Like this is nasty. Look at him eat up the space and attack, and then just drop the hips and pop out. Like this is teach tape how to run. You know that deep comeback type. Of, this is a great route, and even within that, Elam is still in decent position now. Would you like him to come up and make the tackle as soon as really gets the ball? Sure. This is a great route against a wide receiver one. And that's also another piece too. Like this happening here, this doesn't mean that Kyer Elam sucks. This means Calvin Ridley's good. Like, yes, you'd like Elam to make the play. This is a great route. This is nasty. Again, he is Ugh. must watch type, uh, you know, receiver footage every year. How quickly he eats up that cushion. It's just unreal. And so, yes, Elam has to open up and get into his maintenance leverage and get outside and get into that bail technique. And then watch how again you're, you're selling vertically, right? Really sell, selling and vertically. And especially, too, because it, it's third and 11, Eric. So he's selling yeah. like, oh, I'm going vertical. I got to get past the sticks. Right. And then watch him drop. Look at that. Like he's bending at the hips, dropping all of his weight. And then he snaps it around. The ball's on him. But more importantly, I want to talk about this from, the, again, the, the harmony standpoint, right? the mm -hmm. pass rush plan and, and the, the blitz that is sent here. The Bills send a blitz here and it takes too long to develop. Like, look mm -hmm. at the, you got three guys right here. You got Taron coming off the edge. You got a contained player and Jordan Phillips. So the Bills send a blitz here and it takes too long to get home. You know, the, the coverage is not expecting Lawrence to hold on to the ball this long. So much so, I mean, Lawrence has a free runner here. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens when you run some of these fire and zone blitzes where you're dropping guys out in the zone and not playing man coverage. This isn't man coverage. This is actually zone coverage. It's a zone blitz, but it, it takes too long to develop Anthony mm -hmm. and that does not help the pass coverage. And in fact, again, mm -hmm. while this is a hell of a route by Ridley here, Lawrence had a touchdown to Kirk down the middle of the field, because yeah. again, the cover, it just shows you the coverage is not expecting to have to cover that long when you're sending an extra guy, when you're sending what six guys here, uh, no five guys here. Like, yeah. You're not expecting Lawrence to be able to make this throw. And it's awesome to, well, not awesome for Bills fans, but how we opened up the show talking about the Jags pass, per, pass, pass, oh, yikes, pressure package plan on sure. third downs. That is hard to say. Um, and how that meshed well with what they were doing on the back end and how they played the situation, played the sticks, and the rush plan worked with what they did from a coverage standpoint. The Bills did it a ton last week. You don't see it on this one. And it's even more frustrating. Like, Taron Johnson gets close. Yeah. He's there. So it, it has the opportunity to be there. But this is just – this is a good microcosm of – what the Jags were able to do, it was either Lawrence being able to get the ball out quickly or the rush not getting there in time and or the rush not marrying up with the coverage on the back end and all those pieces. Like, you get Taron Johnson coming off the edge here, but the depth he starts at and where it comes from and like how the Bills get into it, it just takes a little too long. Lawrence is able to exploit it. Like, he literally, you see him on that drop. He looks and he sees Taron Johnson coming. Mm -hmm. right yeah out of the they're really quick in that window he yep. looks and he sees him so he knows okay i got maybe like another couple of beats and that's what helps him make that throw so it's not by luck that he got it just off in time before taron got him he peeped him coming from that slot blitz and he knew how much time he had and you know again tip your cap good play yeah and so we talk about uh, the zone corner and elam watch him on this play first and ten play uh, five zero nine in the third quarter. Watch this recognition by him on this little fake pitch out and watch the transition there. That's yes. nice. Like right? that is very nice. So he lets Ridley go and then he gets his eyes on the next threat. That's, you know, kind of that three level type passing concept where you're that deep route, intermediate route, and then a short route. Look at him take away that underneath route there uh, with really nice transition again, in zone coverage from Elam on that play. Yeah. Really smooth speed turn from him. Um, those just in case like they don't know that speed turn is because he turns over that left shoulder does that quick speed turn if he opened up from the inside and kind of dropped his right hip and opened up his chest to Ingram that would be more of a slow turn but he gets that speed turn gets his head around immediately gets his eyes on Lawrence and his eyes on Ingram 
Lawrence is looking right there. Like he has the opportunity to get there. Elam takes that away. So this is good recognition from him with some misdirection. And you look, Lawrence is like ready. Like he cocks it. He's ready to fire it, but he has to pull it down because of the positioning that Elam is in. It's real easy with the Jags misdirection. And they have a really good misdirection yeah. package, both in the run and the pass. Like kudos to Doug Peterson. He's done that for like ever, wherever he's been. It's easy to get kind of lost in the sauce with the misdirection and, or, you know, you're trying to find your bearings on this play. Like, okay, who's coming from where Elam IDs it. He picks up Ingram. He takes it away. He stays flat. He doesn't give ground, even if he's in position. But Eric, if he pushes a little too deep towards like past the 40, maybe Lawrence has the opportunity to dump it off and get a little more yards and get it to Ingram. You know, maybe if he turns off and follows, you know, Ridley going upfield, like you have highlighted there, Ingram's wide open underneath. There's all these opportunities for him to kind of fail and instead he IDs Ingram, hits that speed turn, stays flat, gets on him, and it's a, it's a good job from him on this rep. Yeah, I, I like that from him there. You know, that's a really mm-hmm. good play. And it's a it's a play that earlier in the game they got the Bills on, like one of the first – I think it might have been the very first two plays where they're running some of that boot action. You oh, saw, absolutely, yep. We saw them uh, take advantage of those three-level concepts. So yep. we're in the third quarter now. Um, Elam's to the top of the screen. This is uh, man coverage. And, again, a blitz – where Lawrence is able to hang in there on, on second and nine here. He's able to hang in there versus this blitz. And, you know, it's I would like better coverage on this, but I don't want uh, really to cross the face of Elam there. I want to see a, a smoother transition from Elam on this play. Uh, but he's, you know, kind of clutching and grabbing right there. But mm-hmm. it's another one of those plays, Anthony. I don't think the defense or the secondary is expecting Lawrence to be able to get this ball off with all of these guys coming at him. One. Two, three, four, five, six guys. This is a six man pressure. Like, there should be an unblocked defender coming and hitting Lawrence before this pass can be delivered. Yeah, or heating him up a little quicker. Right. And especially considering what we've seen, like, we've seen the Bills' five man pressures, but especially their six man pressures, and especially where, you know, um, Bernard is kind of crossing from that linebacker spot. Like we've seen these rushes work really well for the bills in terms of the timing and how it pairs and meshes with the secondary. And again, you just don't see it there. And that, I think that's a huge piece too, that people don't see like the angle that Elam takes on this one. Like, He's expecting more of a quicker throw. He's expecting this ball to come out. It's second and nine, and so he's in press already. He sees the initial stem from Ridley. He knows the blitz call, but then the pressure doesn't get there. So now Lawrence has this too, Anthony. Like the pacing from Ridley. Look how he changes his – he manipulates his stride right right there. Yes. He's tough to guard, man. Like that's a tough gauge for any corner, let alone, you know, Elam who was just thrown into the mix here. Absolutely. Like there is – something to be said for the caliber of opponent you are covering. And this is not to, again, mm. you know, talking about the pressure piece and talking about Elam covering Ridley, this is not to make excuses and gloss no, over no, anything, no. but it's not like Kyrie Elam was out there getting worked by, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I don't know, some like fourth or fifth string receiver from some team. Calvin Ridley is a legitimate wide receiver one. He was knocking off the rust a little bit to start the year, but he's rounded back into form. He's fast. He's got powerful strides. And Eric, you highlighted that pacing on this route. He's got that technicality and nuance to his game. He's a complete wide receiver. Mm -hmm. He runs a good route on this play. The rush doesn't get home. Lawrence is able to have that time and pick apart everything on the back end because the Bills don't have that huge coverage numbers advantage because they sent six. And again, things not meshing well combined with the player in the situation. Jags went out. Yeah, and so we're going forward to the fourth quarter, top of the fourth quarter. First and 10 situation, Lawrence is under center. Big time throw uh, from under play, under center, play action, um, drink. <laughs> it's time to drink anytime yeah, right. you say that. <laughs> um, and, and this is a great route, and, and it really, it, you know, it's not good coverage from Elam because he gets into the blind spot. But I want, want you to watch what happens as far as the coverage goes. So you see Kirk coming out into the slot. And the Bills are adjusting their coverage, and they're essentially playing cover three like you're going to see a lot of times. And so watch Hyde. He comes into the box, and this is cover three, which means that he actually is the flats player. But because he's coming down into the box, kind of like you saw Jenkins do, you know, he's got he's to honor run, then get to his drop. But he's obviously not as deep as you'd like him. He's not able to really kind of undercut or deter this throw, and he's also keeping an eye on this guy. But he's... Also sort of leaving Elam out to dry here because he should be helping taking that away a little bit more. But in the end, the coverage from Elam, it's not good. You know, he's mm-hmm. in his bail technique, and then you'll see 
as Ridley kind of stems outside here, he gets into that blind spot, Anthony. Yep. And that's when Elam panics and where you, you see some of those issues when you're talking as a zone defender where that guy gets into his blind spot and he can't feel or sense him, unlike mm -hmm. Dane Jackson, who is very good in zone. And he can sense that guy even when he is in his blind spot while looking at the quarterback. Elam panics. He flips around. And the next thing you know, that's really snapping that route off. And it's a big game. Once Ridley, really any receiver, but especially like a receiver of like Ridley's caliber, once he gets into that blind spot, he knows that he's yeah, got you. Yeah. And it there's it's no coincidence that once Elam like flips and turns to really start to run, Ridley snaps it off. Like the and timing again, the is great. <laughs> Bro, I was going to say, the route, look at, if you let it run in snaps real time, off. he's cooking. Boop. Look how quickly he snaps it off. It's not like one, two, three, four, five, six, and I come out of my break. It's bam, 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 and he's turned out like – he he's got good feet. He's able to sink those hips. It's fluid. It's technical. It's powerful. And the the piece with Elam, this was one of my biggest worries, like for him coming out because of like not how much bail because of the lack of bail that he played at Florida. And we saw this a lot from him as a rookie, you know. And it happens to corners in general playing that bail technique, like guys getting your blind spot. But it's this is like one of my biggest areas of concern with him is guys are still able to get into that blind spot, and you pair that with his ability and not in a good way, but his ability to panic when certain things go wrong, you can almost see him be like, Oh, uh Oh, yeah. and that that's an example of it right there. And Ridley took advantage of it. And it's hard to live in that world in general, but especially against a true wide receiver one you're you're asking for it. Yeah. And I thought McDermott did a good job of <clears throat> kind of like disguising his coverages. First of all, hey. disguising his coverage. So you saw a lot of this. So Elam's right here in the slot. And a lot of they did this several times where they showed man coverage across the board with hideout here on the tight end. Hey, it's man coverage. But then post snap, they dropped into zone uh, more of a, a, a Tampa two might even be. Yeah, it looks like a Tampa two type look here. Um, but you see Elam in the slot getting, you know, to that second level and helping take it, take this away. They're basically running like a smash here. Mm -hmm. He's coming inside. So the Bills showed man coverage. They disguise it. They, they drop out in the zone. Elam does a good job of disrupting and choking off that route. And as Elam, as uh, Lawrence goes into scramble drill mode, you'll see Elam come down here, and then Hyde will kind of you know sink back. It's a very good pass off. So now again, scramble drill mode, start the plaster. That's something that Elam talked about when we had mm -hmm. him in the film room. And then Lawrence uh, it just scrambles uh, for a few yards on this play, a five yard gain. So really cool stuff when we're talking coverages and what they're showing pre to post snap. Now later in the game. They showed man coverage. They played man coverage, and with yeah. and Ridley, Ridley got hide on a slot fade. But yeah. so there again, there's that chess match. But I thought right here, this is a, a nice little wrinkle, and throwing Elam into the fire. You know, you're expected to to do everything uh, in this defense. And I will say, the safeties and defensive backs this year under McDermott are having to do a lot more than mm -hmm. they did under Leslie Frazier. There's one. It was a third down um, early. I think in the first quarter. Jags end up getting they they run a smash concept. Bills are in cover two, but Elam comes across the field in motion with his man, and he's the split field safety, and Dane Jackson mm. is the cloud corner underneath. And again, it, and doesn't it was a work, big but... smash concept that they completed yes. to Christian Kirk, and yes. he's a half field or split field safety, like you said. He's that deep half yep. safety. Who do you mm -hmm. think that gets charged to? And that's not I even really wonder. his fault. Yep. And that's not even really his fault on that corner route. You know, Dane was playing the sticks and, and Ridley at the sticks on third down, like you talked about on that high low for, of a corner. He's got to honor sink. the underneath. He's route. got to underneath yep. other, other stuff underneath. And he's not able to drop back and deter that throw deep. And of course that gets charged to Elam. So that's why I honestly, that's why I didn't even put that in here. Cause it's not even worth talking about mm -hmm. because that's one of those things that like, Hey, Elam's going to be charged for that, but really it's not his fault as a split no. field safety. That, and that that route concept, that smash comp concept is literally like a cover two beater and it yeah. beats the cover two spot there. But it's just, it speaks to that idea of, you know, some of the cool things McDermott's throwing out there and what's being asked of these corners. And yeah, it's neat seeing Elam on this one, you know, in the slot and being able to function and what he's able to do here. And we continue to see, Oh, like I don't, ooh, I don't like this idea. From, I don't. There's so I think there's a lot of because the Bills have the corner depth. I think <laughs> this is part of like this is the in season version of Christian Benford to safety. Christian oh, Benford yeah, to safety, yeah. and yeah. I understand it, right? If you've got all this corner depth, and it's fair to be concerned about the long term viability of Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. And then if you add it up with some of the struggles, but I just think it's it's such a harder transition from corner to safety than people really give it credit for. 
Yeah, and, and you saw in the last play when he's in the slot and he's kind of uh, getting out of there, it's kind of clunky. It's not the smoothest transition. And yeah. if you're talking about specifically playing playing safety in this defense and what the, the defense, uh, what they're asking of these safeties, you know, over the years and even this year, like mm-hmm. – I don't I don't want him no disrespect to him. I don't want him back there and and, and dealing with that. And we we're talking about we're gonna see it on this play, the tackling thing yeah, and why he gets pulled in this game. Bro. Like I don't know. I don't want him Imagine. failing from depth in a quarter's yeah, coverage. Right. You know, I don't. Imagine him having to be the alley player and coming up yeah. and fitting and having to make the play. Like I don't want him living in that world. But it's no. fair to ask that question. I understand sure. where it comes yeah. from. All right, so on to some of the the run fit stuff. It's really why he got benched, as we talked about. So watch him bottom the screen here and he he's coming downhill and he's he, again he's that contained player so mm-hmm. he does technically does his job forces him mm-hmm. inside but he misses that tackle and then mm-hmm. that that's another that's a nine yard gain after that this is I only let's see I cut up I think three or four of those type of plays where technically you know he may get credited for the tackle because he actually had a bunch of tackles in this game but he, he slipped did, yeah. off a lot of them too right yep. um this is one of those plays where he slipped off of them and and it really it hurt them because that's a nine yard gain now. Yeah, and but like you said, like he gets into position there. Like he he does a good job, like with Ridley trying to block him, and he gets into a good spot. And, and but the big thing is, if he makes this tackle, this is what like a two, three, maybe a four yard gain, depending on how much ETN falls forward. That's a big difference versus what he ends up getting. And again, this is symptomatic of or representative, I should say, of so much of him in the run game, like being in the fit but not being able to make that play and coming so close and just slipping off these running backs and that's something that you can't have in really any defense but especially a sean mcdermott defense uh, eric i love that you brought up the super chat yeah. um brandon appreciate mm-hmm. you being here and uh for your donation thank you very much brandon says do you think we see more of josh's legs with our defensive injuries oh and then a cool comment on the back and says also love your guys work and constant effort eric i think maybe that ties into kind of the bigger piece of you know does this team start to kind of put more onus onto the offense to potentially carry more of this team now that they've had these significant defensive injuries and maybe they potentially feel like there's less balance. So they have to put, you know, more explosivity into the offense to try and carry the day. What are your thoughts on that to answer Brandon? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a a theory where, yeah, you know, the offense has to open up a little more and maybe not play as tight to the vest. We talked about in the beginning, they need to do something Mm -hmm. to get the defense to honor Josh Allen, the runner. Because mm-hmm. it's not in the offense, and it was all off season. That's what you want. That's what they were telling us they were going to do. Yeah. They were going to get Josh Allen weapons, especially in the running back room, that you know that would lighten his load as far as you know not having to do everything, especially when it comes to the run game. But they need again. They need to do something to to make that defender, uh, make that defense res- respect his legs, uh, mm-hmm. whether he keeps the ball or not. There something needs to be done there because. Being a shotgun all the time, you're not getting the box, and you're not getting the the um, added benefit of mm-hmm. having him as a runner now. So yes, you're getting a lot of six man boxes and running well against it for the most part, but you could be getting a plus one even more if you had the threat of Josh Allen, and there's just no threat of it. That sprint draw, that duo after he hands it off when he runs to the sideline, that's that's not being honored. No one's mm-hmm. no one is even paying attention to that. So you're not getting the numbers that you really could be getting to even maybe open up the run game more from shocking. Absolutely. can be able to create some opportunities on the backside. Yeah. If you're pulling that, you know, backside defender, that BCR guy off the edge. Um, I, I do think, you know, and I mentioned it earlier, I think they're keeping the Josh Allen run game in their back pocket for that break glass in case of emergency mm-hmm. piece. And, you know, maybe they feel like that emergency creeps up a little bit more, but I think whether it's, down the stretch or in certain games that potentially matter more quote unquote, or once we get to the playoffs, I do think that is something they're going to uncork and they're just trying to save it. Especially. I mean, I don't know. Josh is out there scrambling and still trying to truck linebackers. So they're like, all right, let's protect this guy from himself until we really need that piece. Oh, Eric, we got to stop again. Um, (laughs) Got a super chat from Jason. Appreciate you, Jason, uh, for being here and for the Super Chat. Also, again, shout out to Brandon for the kind words on the back end of his Super Chat. That was awesome. Jason says, I love you all. I love you guys, and you don't need to answer any questions except this one. Where should I put my cover one sticker that I got with my one pass membership? Eric, I was going to say, this is all you. Like, I can't. Yeah. So, if you guys don't understand, so he's one of our insiders. He, he, you know, he gets the premium content that we have. And when you do that, when you sign up for one pass, uh, you get a t shirt and you get um, a, a sticker with a, a logo on it. And, mm-hmm. um, I would say, listen, I, 
I love stickers. You know, my kids love stickers, but I am not a guy that likes to put stickers on their car. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what type of Humpty you may be driving, I drive two beat up cars as my personal rides, and I still don't want to put stickers on them. So I would lean more towards your beer fridge, where you watch the games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have an old laptop, put it on there. I, I just I'm not a guy that likes putting stickers uh, on on personal vehicles. So I, that, I would go with like the beer fridge or where you hang out and watch the game. Your man cave. I say go big or go home. Put it on your forehead. And make sure it stays there and let everybody know what's good. Let them know what one pass is. Be a walking advertisement. Go big or go home. In a serious fashion, yeah, I'm all about the the old electronic devices or kind of like things that I still use. So like an old iPad or an old laptop or, I don't know, throwing it up on your dresser or some like piece in your closet, something. Or, yeah, I like the man cave idea. Ooh, comment here from mini RJ. Fridge. I put mine on the yeah. mini fridge. I had a thought there as yeah. well. I didn't. I was going to say fridge, and then in my head I was like, is it not going to stick? And then I was like, no, of course it's going to stick. Fridge yeah. is a good option too, um, whether mini fridge or regular. But that's a very good question, Jason. And also uh, shout out to you, Jason, for, again, you know, being a, a one pass member here and subscriber us. and being, yeah. Yeah, being here with us every week. Eric, we got oh, uh, my we goodness. stop again. <laughs> this is my favorite name of anyone who watches the content. Save a whale, ride a running back. I love it. Um, uh. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for the super chat. And save a whale, ride a running back says – McD has this defense playing well. Finally unlocked AJ Epinesa after people wanted him gone in August. Definitely might be okay because of McD's aggression and scheme despite the injuries. Eric, we talked about, mm. you know, the loss of Tremaine Edmonds and how McD would, you know, kind of scheme some things around. And we saw the unleashing of Terrell Bernard. I think it's a lot to ask of, you know, this defense to play. Milano's an all pro. Daquan was yeah. playing at an all pro level. Like, I don't, I don't know if anybody saw Seth Walder's graphic from the other day of how successful he was in pass rush win rate and how much he was double teamed. He's in a standard of all by himself in the upper right quadrant. In addition to what he does as a run defender, there's, it's a lot to ask, but I, I think Eric, I am somewhat on board with this idea of Sean McDermott has been tremendous from a schematic perspective this year, and we know the experience he has. If there is anyone that can kind of mitigate these losses in some way, shape, or form, I do feel confident in Sean McDermott potentially being that kind of guy. Again, it's a tough ask, and it sucks, <coughs> and this isn't to put a silver lining or spin on anything. But, you know, McDermott's got the track record. He gets the most out of his players, and, you know, maybe there is something to be said for this kind of comment here or idea here. Right, and we talked about it several times over the last few weeks is that scheming the scheming on that side of the ball is, uh, is so much different this year than prior years and they're making even though lawrence had a decent day they're making these quarterbacks have to work through whatever they're throwing at them and so um i do think this this team this this defense was built with depth um and again you're not going to replace the guys that went down but they have some some players at those positions that they've invested in that they, they believe in, and I do think that you know the edge guys for the for example the edge guys have done really well with Von Miller still working back and Epines yeah. is one of those guys Rousseau I know he's banged up he'll be back probably in a couple of weeks like I think I'm not as worried because it's our head coach's forte and we're seeing mm -hmm. the film of him do some really cool things that I think will. Uh, sustain this defense as being very good. Maybe they drop off from being top five and maybe drop closer to 10, but I still mm -hmm. think they'll be very good. And if they mm -hmm. keep creating these takeaways, mm -hmm. everything else will work out. Yeah, absolutely. Eric, we got a, we got another oh my one. Goodness. Appreciate your true <laughs> guns coming. for being here and for the super chat. True guns is a straight up question with this one. He says that deep catch with digs, the 50, 50 ball. Uh, why couldn't we challenge that? They both had the ball at the same time going down. Um, and then he also says playoffs only matter. We will be ready. I like that back end piece. You know, I'll take, I'll take the bills limping into the playoffs at 10 and seven or whatever, and then making yeah. a run. I only care about the title and the championship. What happens come playoff time to answer the first question. If Eric, if I am correct here, I think Williams had that ball coming down. Like it was clear. Yeah, it was I think clear. It, yeah. I think it was less, you know, simultaneous possession and more. It was Williams's ball as he came down and it wasn't like he wrestled it away once they came down to the ground. Yeah, and we talked about it when we were, you know, breaking it down uh, early on. Initially, Diggs did have it, but I think as he was coming down and starting to brace himself because he had to go up, climb the ladder to get it, yeah. whereas Williams didn't have to jump as high. He kind of played it on the low end of it. Um, as Diggs was coming down, that's when Williams had the power and force to kind of wrestle it away, and it just seemed too clear to me to even even waste a challenge on that. Yeah, absolutely. Fair point, but 
Good quote. Good question. Good thought. And appreciate the super chat. All right. So All let's right, let's get to back the to the film. We're running. We're running behind, guys. That was an awesome. It's not awesome our fault. Run there. It's not our fault. Um, all right, so uh, let's get into this play here. This is the, the the tackle, the missed tackle from Elam at the top of the screen that got him pulled from this game for Ingram. And so you see him come down. Again, he reads this duo run call from shotgun, come down, but then just doesn't have, doesn't close and, and squeeze down, and he just whiffs on the tackle. We'll see it on the right side of the screen here. Comes down from depth and then just doesn't close width-wise. He doesn't close down on the block on Johnson and, and misses the tackle there. This is the four minute mark, right? There's a four yeah. minute mark, first and 10 situation. And that very next play, Anthony, that's, that's when they basically uh, said, Hey, Elam, you're done for the game. And most people thought it was because he, he was getting torched by, you know, Ridley, but it was really because of the situation of, Hey, Jags are trying to run the clock out. We want a guy to be in there to make the tackle, not slip tackles and, and yeah. whip on tackles. Every yard matters in general, but especially in these situations when you're trying to get that ball back and Elam was just slipping off too much. And again, it's a shame because he reads it and he triggers like you see him. He, he doesn't even drop like you see him bounce his feet and he comes up and he fires up and the angle that he takes isn't ideal. You also have that speed at ETN like they get even with each other really quick. And then Elam's kind of like playing off the back of ETN and has to lunge. But again, it's it's representative of like what he is like so close and almost there, but just unable to really make that like changing play or to make that strong play. And again, like at a situational moment where you need that, it's understandable why they look somewhere else. No doubt. So that kind of concludes the Elam segment. We're going to move on real quick. We're going to have to move th through this quickly, Anthony. Uh, we're going to look at some uh, film from Dorian Williams, who I thought for all things considered, yes, played pretty well. It. I think he played pretty well. Uh, I do think you could tell the game was a, a click uh, faster than what he expected, but mm -hmm. he made a few plays in that short, um, you know, stint that he was in yeah. there. Um, this this one was one of amazing. Them. This, this one's is amazing. one of them, right? This, this is, is he one. drops into coverage here and he, you know, he's got a crosser in front of him. And rather than just jump that crosser from Kirk, he's reading the quarterback's eyes and he senses that route coming behind him. This is that drive concept, right? Mm -hmm. You got a shallow drag and then a dig behind him. He senses that. Never, not once did he look back at this, this target, this tight end, but he's able to make a play on the ball, Anthony. I love this. And you hit it, that drive concept. It is designed to put that linebacker into conflict, into hell. You run that drag in front of him. If he comes up and plays that, you hit the dig behind him. If he sits back and doesn't play up on the dry, on the drag, you hit the drag. And for a, a player in Dorian Williams, whose biggest, you know, for me, adjustment in making, making it in the NFL is from a coverage standpoint and adjusting to the type of schemes and coverages he's going to have to run here with the Bills in the NFL versus what he did at Tulane. I thought I, that's why I said this play so was nice. amazing because like it's a good play, but especially considering where he's coming from and how much of an area of opportunity his coverage game was, not from an athleticism standpoint, but from a recognition standpoint and a responsibility standpoint. This is beautiful. He drives on that drag route, but as he does it, he's watching Lawrence and he reads his eyes and puts his foot in the ground. And also that's key too. Like, look how he puts that foot in the ground and it's like two little hops and just plants and drives back. You see some of that athleticism some and that he length. reads it. Yep. You see that length and the long arms coming into play and you hit it on the head. Like he doesn't have to look back and see that dig coming. He doesn't have to go, Oh, here comes the drive concept. He's reading Lawrence as he's driving on the shallow drag. That's a tremendous play for a rookie linebacker who comes from a very basic level coverage system and structure at the university of Tulane. All right. And so we kind of get into, uh, you know, why he was kind of pulled and uh, it's one thing with this staff with McDermott is, Hey, if, uh, if you're missing tackles, that's probably the quickest way to end up on the bench. And uh, Dorian, mm -hmm. again, I thought for some of the nice things he did, uh, these are the type of plays that kind of got him uh, put on the bench and, and Dotson mm -hmm. put in the game. Uh, this is, he, he read it perfectly. He closed Really well. Use the boundary as, as another defender here. Break down and make that tackle. I know ETN is very elusive. He's good. And it's a nice spin move. But, you know, he has an opportunity to minimize this play. Instead, you see a, a, a decent gain from the running back. And I understand this the this the notion from I was a lot of people saw it during the game and saw when I posted a couple clips of Dorian Williams and the thought was like oh why did he get pulled or he shouldn't have gotten pulled for the missed tackles you know we need him let him develop understandable um but you know these were egregious like they're bad misses in the open field and you know but again that kind of pairs a little bit with 
sometimes how he plays at the tackle point from a good perspective, he mm-hmm. will run through dudes. Pop, and yeah. yes. And sometimes because he is used to putting his whole body through ball carriers, if your angle isn't right, or somebody sees you come in and they're able to put their foot in the ground and stop on a dime, you kind of overplayed a little <laughs> bit. And, you know, we saw that on a couple reps uh, for Dorian Williams in this game, which is why he was pulled. And again, understandable as you're trying to keep this game close and keep everything in front of you you can't afford to give up extra yards in any way shape or form um whether small or bigger chunks like we saw in that one yeah and this one i put in there because he i i swear he punched the ball out in the middle right? of the field here um right? i i thought for sure this was an incomplete pass but also for elam at the bottom of the screen again zone coverage watch him squeeze this route on the in-breaking route by ridley look at him close that down just both guys right there i, I like these plays from them uh, again Dorian making a play on the ball in the underneath area, um, jumping this. You see that closing speed. Boom. You see him trigger, and then he understands that, hey, you know, I'm going to go for the ball, not necessarily just touch him down. I'm going to go for the ball. I swore this was an incomplete pass, but I want to give credit to him there because, again, playing that underneath area, those zone coverages, um, you know, being thrown into the fire in this game, uh, I thought this was actually a good play. We saw Bobby Babbage working with him on stuff like this uh, that Sunday, that first week of training camp, you know, understanding like leverage and who to pick up and what to read, you know, when you're going against, you know, uh, two by two sets or three by ones and all those pieces. Um, I, yeah, I thought he got enough of it and got got it out in time that this would be incomplete. My favorite piece with it, you know, Eric, you nailed everything. I just love how when he drives right there, you see him as he drives, pause it, like he he's literally looking at the ball. Yep. Like he is looking for that punch. It's not an accident that he gets his hand right on the ball. That's really good awareness in the moment to drive on it and then say, okay, this ball is going to get there. How can I get it out? That's really good awareness, good recognition. And also to tie it into, you know, some of his traits, this is where having those longer arms come into yep. play because he can see what's happening. And then he's got that, you know, Mr. Fantastic reach and he's able to get his hand on the ball. Yeah, and so this is probably the the most egregious one, but it's third and ten, mm. and the the offense doesn't pick up the first down. But again, situationally, you know, Sean McDermott, he's gonna have a short leash on guys like this, especially the young players that they probably weren't expecting the play. So you see him drop into the flats area, cover three, and Lawrence checks it down, and he has a chance to just easily end this play, but he misses the tackle, and thank God. Bernard is there to, mm-hmm. to really wrap up the leg of Ingram here because this would be a first down um, as everyone else kind of rallies to the ball. You see Bernard hanging on for his life right there, saving Williams' ass on this one. <laughs> um, I, this was really kind of the backbreaker for him. But overall, man, like I said, I thought he had a good game. But the missed tackles, like if you if there's mm-hmm. anything from this game and really the Bills defense since this regime's taken over, that you can pretty much guarantee – pretty much two out of three, every two out of three games is that the Bills are going to miss a lot of tackles because of the style of defense they play. Mm -hmm. So I understand people be like, hey, just this is, let him, you know, go through his lumps and and things like this. But situationally, they did not want to have that happen. So they put the vet and Dodson in. Um, But that type of play, that aggressive play and triggering downhill, uh, like you see on this play, is really what's led the Bills to be number one in havoc rate over the last four or five years. They're like, Every single season, they play that aggressive style to create turnovers, to cre- create tackles for losses and sacks and, and turnovers. And so I think he will fit that type of scheme and, and style. Um, I, I, but just on this one, he was just a little too um, a little too jumpy, and it cost him. And, and thank God it didn't cost the defense here. They're still able to stop him short. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and he doesn't even come downhill like too out of control. Out of control. Right. No, he just kind of puts himself out of position, and then he's left lunging, which again is unfortunate just from a entertainment standpoint. Because when he goes through guys with his chest, he really <laughs> pops them. Um, but you know, also kudos to Evan Ingram, who's an athletic tight end, like making yeah. a move in space. But exactly, Eric, you nailed it. Like knowing this situationally. There's you can't allow yourself to get put in that position where you are lunging and to get that caught out. And, you know, kudos to Bernard and, you know, Hyde coming across um, as well and kind of cleaning that up and making things be okay. And um, I don't have too much to add on. I just wanted to bring up the piece of, you know, the nature with the Bills defense. We keep hearing people talk about, well, they miss tackles all the time. I love the havoc piece that you brought up. The Bills are also usually one of the league leaders in stuff percentage against the run and stuffs are runs that go for zero 
or less yardage. And the Bills, as of now this year, they're fourth in the league in stuff percentage at 25.2%. So they are a defense that will miss tackles from time to time, but they're going to create turnovers. They're going to put you in second and long, third and long situations. That's the style of defense they play. And again, it's kind of hard to fault them considering their year over year success. But in a situation like that, that's where you kind of have to rein it in a little bit. Hopefully he learns from it because I do think – uh, I, I don't want to keep knocking Dodson or pile onto that bandwagon, but I do think, you know, Dorian Williams putting things together would be a significant difference for this defense versus Tyrell Dodson. Right. And to kind of wrap up that whole attack oriented, gr- aggressive style, our boy Pam Moran posted something about the bills having uh, the third worst PFF tackling grade. Um, the bills are always up there and, and, you know, missed tackle percentage. And again, I, we both agree that it has something to do with the style of defense that they play. Because if you look at the havoc rate, which the Bills have been uh, top five over the last few years at um, which Havoc rate is like, hey, um, getting a tackle for loss, a forced fumble, a PBU, an interception or sack. The Bills have been number one several times. In 2000, they're currently first, of, first of all. They're currently first this year. They were first last year. They were first in 2021. Mm-hmm. They were third in 2020. They were second in 2019. First in 2018. And then if you look at 2017, they were 11. So it's it's obvious. It's built into the style of play that this defense wants to play with. And so, as you said, it's the timing of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's the understanding that, hey, it's third and 10. I don't need to come and and, and get out of hand with uh, fitting up the tackle. Like, just make the tackle and the play, and thank God Bernard was there to do that. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's part of the benefits of this Bill's ability to kind of rally and tackle and flow to the football with their speed and aggressiveness. And, you know, we talked about some of the missed tackle pieces. And then as we did that, we talked about Dorian Williams bringing his body through the tackle point. Eric, this one is like, just, it's nice. And I know Dane Jackson Mm -hmm. gets a piece of ETN a little bit and kind of gets him um, off kilter a little bit there. Also shout out to Dane Jackson for taking on the lineman and boxing this in all together. Awesome. Yes. Dane Jackson played very well. Um, I love him boxing this run in and even getting the spin and still being able to affect ETN a little bit. So I wanted to shout out Dane Jackson, but we've got Williams highlighted his ability. He reads this. He sees the flash of color from the pulling guard. He Mm. scrapes over the top. He stays clean. And then how he finishes at the tackle point, just dry. You can almost hear this tackle watching it here, even though it's in silence. Like he brings (laughs) his chest right into ETN's shoulder, drives him into the ground. You can see the physicality. Eric, we saw this a bunch from him in the preseason. It's cool to see him do it against the ones in Jacksonville in a game that he was forced into. Yeah, this was kind of his forte coming out, you know, uh, hitting guys in, in the pop in the pads. Um, as you said, you basically if you go back and listen to it um, when you watch the broadcast, like you can you can feel it, you can see it, you can hear it. Um, he he brings that um, in, in most of his tackles, especially uh, against the run. So overall, I, I think when you're talking Elam, I think it wasn't as bad as most people think. I mm-hmm. I think that. When you add the context to it, and I, a lot of people, as you said, they're going to say, hey, that's an excuse. No, that, it, the rush, we can't like give kudos to McDermott and the defense in prior weeks and say, hey, this, the pass rush is working so well with the coverage. And then when it doesn't, not point it out as being part of the context. Like that's just, that's I always just love when, 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 when context is, oh, you're making an excuse. Sorry, it's the context. Like we're just not yeah. calling out the negatives for that's the purpose of a blitz or pressure is to affect the quarterback and they weren't affecting the quarterback with their blitzes, which put, you know, hung out the defense or the secondary out to dry yeah. many times because you have less guys in coverage. Cause you're sending those extra rushers and you still had time for the quarterback to make those throws. So overall, I thought Elam was, wasn't as bad as what people think. I think we've shown you that the issue late in the game and why he was pulled was really because of the tackling and slipping off some of the tackles and not being a sure tackler. Same thing with Dorian Williams. I think, this defense, they they missed a bunch of tackles. I want to say it was in the 20s in this game. Um, and, again, that's kind of their forte, but 20 is a little high. I'll look it up. But it's one of those things that in certain situations, you got to bring the guy down. And late in the game, I understood why you know they would pull an Elam. Uh, again, it's not going to help his confidence, but um, – <laughs> I understand the reasoning behind it, you know, even though, again, I think it could hurt the long-term development or affect him in the short term, which, again, could carry it into the long term. But And, and that's the 
like the double edged sword or the catch 22 kind of piece. It was, it, that was even like my thought last year when it came to like starting Elam, like Kyrie Elam would probably be in a better position right now in year two, if he saw more reps and more snaps in year one, but there's that trade off of, you know, what's more valuable or more important, like him getting that experience for the future or having a more stable baseline and floor of play as you're trying to chase a Super Bowl and chasing the championship. And, oh, Eric, we got to stop. Uh, we got another Super Chat. Thank you very oh, much, man. Jarrett. Uh, oh, and a nice 20 bucks. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you, you much for being here and for the donation. Oh, and there's not even a question or anything. It's just praise. This is awesome. Jarrett just says, another great session, boys. Thanks so much for your hard work and dedication. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jarrett. Appreciate That's it, brother. That's super cool. Uh, Eric, I believe, you know, what? Yeah, you confirmed 20 missed tackles 20. in that game, which is even for a team like the Bills where – you know, they play aggressive and they will miss some tackles. That's a significant amount. And then again, especially it's a lot different when you're missing tackles in a game that you're up or you're winning versus against a team that's trying to run the ball and run the clock out and you need to get it back. You can't yeah. miss tackles. You have to be sure you have to be safe. But Eric, you know, we leave this Jags game behind, move on to the Giants onward and upward for this Bills team. Where's your head at right now coming out of this game? Are you, are you still thinking about something, you know, schematically from the Jags and going forward? Or is it fully? <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> is a, appreciate your true guns. Uh, another super chat. Thank you very much. True mm -hmm. gun says defense did really good, but in all caps, the offense didn't show up and that's what cost us the game. We move the chains less. We need the defense. So Eric, yeah. Are you echoing, echoing a similar? Yeah. yeah, it's fair. I mean, complimentary football again, it's funny because even in the big wins, like you heard us last week, talk about the pass rush and coverage working together. You heard about complimentary football. Like this week, the offense, they started off slow, and it did cost them in the end. They they got on track too late, and so I will agree with that. I do agree with that. Um, I do think that eventually they did get on track, and once mm -hmm. Josh got into you know some of those tempo situations, and it, it almost – uh, force the defense to struggle a little more because they're not able to call some of those complex looks and pressures and blitzes. And so I think, you know, a little more um, no, uh, no huddle and uh, up tempo may have helped them, but I think they went to it too late and it was just too late for them to recover. So yes, even in losses and wins, we're going to, we're going to say a lot of the same things and complimentary football was not there last week. No, absolutely not. And, you know, the thought is hopefully it'll be going forward against the Giants. So, you know, Eric, as as we wrap up here and shift our focus going forward towards Bill's Giants and what the rest of the season holds, where's your head at right now going forward? Is it on one side of the ball versus the other? Is it on a specific position group or coach? You know, where where is your head right now thinking about here's the Bill's team going into this next game against the Giants and going forward? What are you focused on right now? Just kind of off the top. Um, so I started looking at the Giants defense. Obviously, they're very blitz oriented, number two in blitz rate. Um, and, and 50, so 51, I, 51 percent at number two. That is a ton. Yeah. And so um, I started analyzing why that happened. And when I started watching some of the film and some of the explosive and big plays, the 10 yards or, or more plays and the 20 yards or more plays, I saw certain personnel groupings um, kind of show out. And I saw a lot of you know, obviously the last two weeks, a lot of 21 personnel, a lot of 12, some 13, some 22 personnel. And you're thinking about the last two games that they played in, they played against uh, offenses like the Niners and the Dolphins. So you expect those groupings to be higher with those teams. But they were able to trot out some of those heavy personnels, but not have success running it. Mm -hmm. They would actually come out in those personnel groupings and spread you out. And that's where some of those explosive plays would come against the Giants defense. And so that's where my head is right now. That's what I'm diving into. Some of those, you know, chips formations, some of those empty sets, but from heavy personnel groupings to get the base defense of the Giants on the field, but to more importantly, spread them out so that Josh can see those pressures and uncover those coverages more. So that's where I started most of my research today. Um, and you're going to see, and keep an eye on the concussion protocol with Don Kincaid. He was limited today from what we saw. Um, you saw Dawson Knox dealing with injuries, so maybe the Bills can't use some of those personnel because of those injuries. I assume those guys play uh, by the time the, as the week progresses, but <clears throat> I think that's that's where they should start to look to attack if those guys are healthy. Um, heavy personnel groupings, spreading them out a little bit, ball control style from spread formations, but heavy personnel grouping. And when they go with those heavy personnel groupings or those pro personnel groupings and you know, 12 or 21 or whatever – You've got Kincaid, you've got Knox, you've got Gilliam. You have that athleticism. Eric, mm -hmm. we showed it 
with what they did with those personnel groupings, but going and spread against the Miami Dolphins and the hell mm-hmm. that it put the Miami Dolphins defense in and the Giants defense, <laughs> you for aggress- as aggressive that as they are and what they've, you know, kind of reinforced their group a bit on defense. You can put those second linebackers in hell with a lot of misdirection. Bobby mm-hmm. Okereke, they brought him in, but you can get him. He can get got in the past game. He's been caught out of position a bunch this year. So I love the idea and the notion of Kincaid really eating potentially in this game. And, you know, I am very focused on, the blitz side of it, you know, with what the Jags did with their blitz packages yes. against the bills in this game, succeeding at a level and, that no God. And you think Brian Dable knows these protections, right? Right. And he's working with, I don't know, like Martindale. the godfather yeah. of yeah. blitzes right now with wink Martindale. Like something he, to think about he blitzes when he's like at the dinner table, like he's all mm-hmm. attack minded, but what's interesting, Eric. So the giants defense, 51% blitz rate, going into this past week against Miami, which was the second highest. But the Giants, when they rush five or more, a.k.a. blitzing, they're only 26th in pressure percentage, and they're 31st in sack percentage. So they are blitzing a ton, but it hasn't been working. And you juxtapose that with, you know, Brian Dable, knowing the Bills' offense and the protection plans potentially, the Bills being good, particularly Josh Allen, against the blitz traditionally, and on the year – when they do blitz too, it, they're giving up 7.2 yards per attempt, 29th Dang. in the league. So, and they're giving up a, over 100 passing yards a game when they blitz, 31st in the league. Um, their their sack per attempt when they blitz is only is 2.9 percent. That's 31st. So, yeah, they're they're adding pressure. They're trying to affect the quarterback, but it's not really working. And no. but that's Martindale's thing. It's yep. it's very it's a similar style to Rex Ryan. It's very bit. similar. Um, so that's that's their thing. But um, yeah, I'm excited, man. I'm excited. Um, about the whole storylines of Dable and how important he was to Josh's career. It's uh, it's going to be a fun game Sunday night. Yeah, I definitely feel like a bit of a curmudgeon because I'm like, man, I got to stay up late on a Sunday and then get up early on Monday. I'm like, this sucks. That's my only negative and detraction piece. But it should be a fun game. Like you said, we're going to get out of here now yeah. on the Cover One Film Room. We appreciate you folks. Everybody who joined us live in this episode, thank you so much. We know between the loss and the injuries, it was a bit of a down week. You wouldn't have really known it from the attendance and all the engagement from you folks joining us tonight. So everybody who joined us live, thank you so much for joining us live. We greatly appreciate it. All the super chats that came through. Wide Towns King, Brandon, Jason M, yeah, Save thanks, a Whale, guys. Rider Running Back, True Guns twice, and Jarrett Faust. We appreciate you folks just being here. But again, donating and throwing some, you know, some shekels our way. We greatly appreciate it. Before anybody leaves or jets, please, 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 and thank you, drop a like on this video. It goes a long way towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. If you are watching later and not watching live, that's cool too. Please drop a like on this video. If you're listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, that's awesome too. Please rate and review and subscribe to the Cover One Film Room. While you're here on YouTube, subscribe to Cover One as a whole, in addition to the film room, we have you covered as a brand literally seven days a week, depending on when game days are uh, and when Greg and Aaron do the post game show, but pretty much have you covered seven days a week, every week with everything and anything you need for the Buffalo bills. We appreciate you folks, whether live post live, listen, view, download, whatever, tell your family and friends and loved ones about how awesome this show is. If you thought it was terrible, tell your enemies, We appreciate you. Thank you again for the Super Chats. Shout out and get yourself into that One Pass premium membership area like Jason M. We got the link in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or any podcasting app or platform you are listening to this show on. But we got to skedaddle. Keep it here locked in on the brand for Greg and Aaron um, with a really good Giants guest. about to kick off some pieces. Yeah, Yeah, Nick is sweet. Uh, Or feel free to go back onto the channel and watch my episode of Disguise Coverage last night with Justin Pennick from Talking Giants. Also a good time. Or check out anything else on the brand for myself, Anthony Prohaska for Eric Turner. That's going to do it for us here in the Cover One Film Room. We will see you live next Wednesday, October 18th, 7 p.m. Eastern to break down the most important pieces from Bill's Giants. But until then, Godspeed. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. If you're going to the game, be safe and don't get caught in traffic on your way home. We'll see you next week, Wednesday. And as always, go Bill.